Although they did start working with the Beals revolver in the year of 1856, it would not be the same as what you think of the Remington New Model Army today. And if you're like me, you're into the history stuff, uh, the books, you like the guns are worth their weight. Because uh, again, it's fun to shoot, it's fun to point with, but without the story there, uh, if you're a history person like I am, without the story, it really doesn't mean all that much. Ruger Security 9. Can I already draw? You already looked? No. <laughs> you sure right. you did? Now on three. Another pro, at least a pro to me, is these guns are kind of a project. I like to look at them as I'm getting an advanced kit build in the mail whenever I get one. So it's a project that you can go down the road and you can either leave it as Most people believe that the Walker was Colt's first extent to a very, very large pistol, but it wasn't. This was. This is Colt's 1839 to patent firearms revolving carbine pistol. It is massive. This is going to be a strange one because I had planned to have some people on tonight, but didn't work out. And so uh, it's just me for the moment. Uh, Duke got called into work, kind of a last minute deal, and Snapper is going to be late if he gets here at all. So it's just me and you. <laughs> if you can put up with me for a little while, we probably won't go real long unless Snapper shows up. But, uh, I will just be reading your comments, and we'll just have a conversation, just you and I. Hey, I looked at the camera. You guys like that instead of looking at the screen? My camera's above my screen, so if I look at the screen, I'm not looking at you. So anyway, without further ado, can everybody hear me okay? All right, because I don't have anybody to bounce my microphone off of and make sure it's working. <laughs> all right, so tonight we have Diane Houston says, good evening, all. But Carol Joel said, good evening, one and all. Finally getting to watch alive again. You all live? Well, unfortunately, it's just me. By the way, if my face looks red, it's because I don't have on any black this time. That's why I always wear either a black hat or a black shirt, because otherwise it washes everything out red on me. <laughs> looks like I'm sunburned. Look like brother love. Anyway, um, Turkey Creek 1823 is here. He says, uh, TC here. Hi, Turkey Creek. Joshua Harris says, good evening, everyone. Brandon Birch said, great to see y'all again, ready for some laughing and learning. Well, I don't know how much of that there will be today, but we'll give it our best shot. Uh, let's see. Doug Duke says, good evening, all. Rock McLaughlin says, good evening, Rock from Tennessee, waiting for the show. Well, here we go. Uh, Doug Duke said, Duke, i got a question. The picture you posted of you in your new pants and vest, the pistol belt, how wide was it, 1.5? Well, if he happens to pop up in the chat or something, I'll remind me and we'll ask him. Louisiana Gray said, a good evening to all. Kodak Tackman said, what's going on? Louisiana Gray said, good evening to all. Texan1836 said, evening, fellas. Question, let's see. Do I need to go to all of your pages on another device to ensure you all get likes? <laughs> well, I guess if you want to. Uh, Deja Vu's in. Joshua Harris said, Okay, we'll get to that question in just a second, Josh, because that'll be where we start. Uh, Franklin Horse said, howdy. Robert said, strange is good sometimes. Mill Creek said, hello, everyone. Finally get to sit and watch another live show. It's been a while. Well, I hope it don't disappoint because it's just me. AR American's in. He said, hey, Garrett. Louisiana Gray says, that's what I do. Texan Rock McClockin said, here, fine. You're good. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Sounds good. 
Hearing you loud and clear in New Zealand. We got West Covina Dodge, Martin Cavanaugh, David W. said hello, Garrett. Hello to you. Gunsmith 4570, Desert Rat 45, Louisiana Gray said good evening, all. Chris Bird said here for as long as the signal holds out, streaming here in Florida. Oregon Outback says we don't mind you being on by yourself. Just try not to talk over yourself. I will try. I do that all the time. I just did it right there again. But anyway, yeah, so Ethan's running the channel now and he's been running the 11 uh the uh, reload show but the army called him up a little bit for something kind of unexpected not for too long i hope but uh, so he was gone to start with and then one by one our normal people had things come up that and doesn't happen very often but it did this time so unless snapper happens to pop in it's just me maybe plowboy pops in a little later i sent him a link I don't know if he, he got it or not. But anyway, without further ado, Joshua Harris said, question, I'm looking at an affordable kit. I'd love to build a Kibler, but a little out of my budget. I'm looking at an Invest Arms, Gimmer, Hawk, and Flintlock 50. What's your opinions on that kit? Well, I haven't had the actual Invest Arms, Arms Gimmer, but I've had the very close uh, Lyman Great Plains rifle, which was the same thing. It's about as close as you're going to get to the authentic thing as far as a Hawken goes. Now, a few caveats to throw in there, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Turkey Creek 1823 can back me up on this. Uh, the Flintlock Hawken, we do know that, I think we know that some of those existed, especially the quote-unquote Super Hawken that Ashley probably took on the first round, which would have been a very early Hawken. But it was a long stock uh, flinter. The only trouble I have with the Flintlock Hawkins is there's just not a lot of evidence, shall we say, that there was ever a half stock Flintlock Hawkins. However, there were half stock rifles that were planes rifles that were Flintlock. As a matter of fact, I've seen some half stocked uh, Jaegers. As a matter of fact, Kale's bidding on one right now, which is kind of a funny thing because they're extremely early in the 18th century. But there was a half-stock Jaeger. Uh, it's all authentic that Caleb's looking to bid on. And, of course, if you want something like that, the 1803 Harper's Ferry is basically a half-stock Hawken with a round barrel, of course. But uh, it's a it's a half-stock Hawken short gun that has a flintlock on it. So yeah, that's pretty close. Uh, I don't have anything against the uh, the flintlock half stocks. Like I said, obviously they're not 100% uh, correct, but the only things I would say that's wrong with them historically is it's a coil spring lock, which you can upgrade that lock to an L&R if it's a right-handed lock, on I believe, on that gun. Unless I'm mistaken. Now, I'm pretty sure you can uh, if you wanted to, but, I mean, the coil spring probably works just fine. Uh the only other thing I'd say is there's a little bit of a belly on the stock that wouldn't be there on the true Hawken. But like I said, as far as the Hawken kits go, the Invest Arms a Gimmer, as long as you get it with iron mountings, is about as authentic as you're going to get out of a kit gun for, you know, out of a, out of a, what I would say, a, a, a beginner's kit gun, not a, a not like a, when I say kit gun, I could be referring to like a track of the wolf kit gun, which is not a beginner's kit gun whatsoever, but yeah. All right. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, as far as, like I said, as far as the Invest Arms uh, Gimmer goes, I had the Lyman Great Plains and Cap Lock left handed. It was a great rifle. I wound up selling it for something. I can't remember what, but yeah, they're, they're really, really close. Um, I would go check out Ethan Yazel's I Love Muzzle Loading. There is a interview he does on that channel with, come on, TC, why can't I think of his name? He wrote the book on Hawkins here recently. I'll think of it eventually. The new Hawkins Authority, after the old Hawkins Authority was Hanson Jr., the new Hawkins Authority is, starts with a W., I can't think of his last. I'll think of it in a little bit. But anyway, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. And here I am rattling on. So yeah, if you guys have any questions out there, throw them out in the chat because that's really all I got to talk about. 
and uh, most of my study here lately has been in the 1800s. So, or I mean, you could throw any time period out there. But uh, yeah, that's what we'll talk about. Let's see. Let me go on through here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jolly Jake Lovell said, "Open up, open all three up in different tabs and pretend to have a trio." <laughs> there you go. Then there's three of us. Uh, Deja Vu said, I'm glad you're still doing this. Well, we'll like I said, we'll try as long as we can. Uh, Louisiana Gray. Sorry, guys, if I say uh, a lot. I always edit my uh's out in videos, but I say it a lot when I have to carry the conversation. <laughs> uh, Louisiana Gray said, I tried to call men on all three channels. Uh, normal people, Kodak Tackman said. Uh, Louisiana Gray said, comment on all three channels kent said good evening awesome people happy wednesday well happy wednesday to you too uh let's see west Canadian dodge said i'm broke but that kibler fowler looks great yes i did i see that he's coming out with it and if i wasn't so convinced right now that i want to move up to a little harder kit that's probably the one i would be doing but right now i have my eyes set on a a, a gin chambers mark silver virginia rifle in 62 caliber it's kind of my uh not that I need a 62 caliber, but I found a couple references to them in the fur trade. And uh, I feel like even though it's an earlier rifle, it would fit right in. So it's going to go with my uh, 1800s fur trade persona. But yeah, that Fowler looks like it's going to be sweet. And if he's, I don't think he could make the kits any easier to build from Kibler's. Okay. <laughs> the movie Jeremiah Johnson, which model Hawking gun he used? None of them. I have to go back and think, but I'm pretty sure. I don't think it's a Thompson Center because it's pretty early, but it's a half stock. I think it has two keys, so that's right. But it's a lighter colored wood. It has brass mountings, maybe a German silver nose cap. But neither of the guns that he used there, they look like uh, either Spanish or Italian guns. Neither of them really look like a Hawken. For all I know, they could have been original Plains rifles because that was pretty early for, I'm sure Turkey Creek could tell you better. Me and Duke could tell you better too. But uh, they were brass mounted Plains rifles, if I recall right. And so they could have been an early CVA mountain rifle. That's possible. I think one of them did have two wedges, but neither of them were uh, what would actually be considered what looks like a true Hawken uh, in any shape or form. But that movie did a lot for the Hawken, uh, the Hawken uh, name, brand, people. It's funny because the guns that people call Hawkins are actually a lot closer to half-stock Lehman's. I mean, that round patch box and everything, those are, they're pretty close to a historical gun. It's just not a Hawken. Uh, a lot of the brass-mounted Thompson Center guns and stuff like that, they're actually really close to a Lehman. <laughs> so, which that's actually would have been more common in the mountains post-1835 than a Hawken would have. Hawkins were very, they were rare. As a matter of fact, when somebody saw a mountain man with a Hawken, they were there. But if you saw a mountain man with a Hawken, people made note of it, and that's why they show up in letters and whatnot, it's because people are like, ooh, that'd be like, you know, you got your guy down here driving your Honda Civic, and then another guy over here is driving a Corvette with the Honda Civic being a Northwest trade gun and the Hawken being the Corvette. Doesn't mean everybody's got Corvettes. We just made note of that guy because he had one. Very expensive gun. Uh, yeah, Franklin Horse said they make great crowbars. That's what Duke tells me. Yeah, uh, I Love Muzzle Loading has a series of videos on building the Gimmer. Duke says, yes, he does. And Woodfill, Bob Woodfill, I think is his name, who he has that interview with. Screw my name. See what I... Yeah, I think that's his name. Yeah. That I was trying to think of earlier that I love muzzle loading has the interview with, and he goes through exactly how to make a Gimmer in Vest Arms Hawken into one that's really close to an authentic one. Um, Desert Rat said, I have, I found a half stock flint lock that was made in the late 1790s that sold at the auction. The photos were Hawken ish, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And it, they, they existed. Uh, but they weren't Hawkins. But like I said, if you look at the 1803 Harper's Ferry, it's very Hawkin-like. I mean, very, very Hawkin-like. And I believe one of the Hawkins actually, I think it was 
Jaycock and actually worked at Harper's Ferry when they were turning those out and probably took some inspiration from that. But Hawkins, the Hawkins style rifle, it, it's just a name of a gun that was being built all over the country at the time. And, you know, that's just one, that's like, that's just one version of the Plains rifle, but they were very high end versions and that's why they were so expensive. They were high end guns. They were good guns. Uh, but if you were a trapper going out with a company and even if that company had bought Hawkins, they would give the trappers going out. A lot of times the, the way it worked was you would, pick up your your stake your gear at the first of the year when you went out and then you would pay the company back for all that out of your first fur haul and it was just, it was half the price to get a smooth bore and they were more versatile and so there was a lot of smooth bores went a lot of companies uh supplied smooth bores for their guys but a lot of guys went to rifles eventually but there was the ketlin trade rifle there was a lot of english made trade rifles coming in that were actually way, way cheaper than a Hawking even themselves. So even the rifles that were there, I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of Ketlins. I've seen a lot of uh, Henry's and Derringer's. It's funny, funny names I know, but they're, they're actual rifles that were made in America, a couple of them, but you know, Lehman's later on a lot more kind of mass produced common rifles instead of the Hawkins, which were a higher end gun. Yes, yes, thank Turkey Creek. Bob Woodfill is the name I was looking for. That's what I was looking for. Uh, Louisiana Grace said, I do meal for 48 hours. Oh, you're talking about... Uh, okay, okay, sorry, I missed your comment here. Uh, Louisiana Grace said, this may be off topic, but when you're milling your antique muzzle-loading powder, does it all cake to the bottom even though it's laying on its side? Yeah, it does. It will always work itself to the bottom of that deal. And so what I do is I go out there every eight or 10 hours and I'll take a, just a hammer and turn that plastic upside down because I'm using a PVC jar, tap on it, beat it down, shake it around a little bit and then put it back on and do that two or three times every 24 hours. I'm not milling mine for 48 hours like uh, Jake is. Uh, I probably should. Uh, I've kind of settled on what I want for my powder. It's between GoX and Swiss now. It's taken me a little while to get it there. Not as fast as Swiss, a little faster than GoX, but I'm happy with it because anytime I try to get it hotter, it starts getting dirtier. And I'm not experimenting with all the stuff that Jake is. Jake's always experimenting moving forward. I have a good supply of willow charcoal, and that's what I'm sticking with. So I've found what works for me. And yeah, it's not as good as his or a lot of other people's, but that's where I'm sticking with. In my 24-hour mill of uh, just plain old willow charcoal, uh, skylighter, potassium nitrate, and uh, sulfur uh, working out pretty good for me. And I'm still using lead media. So uh, uh, anytime I get it any hotter by using more compression than I should or whatever, it starts getting dirty. Joshua Harris said, thanks. I will check that all out. I only want a flint because caps are hard to come by and I want to learn to make my own caps. Well, that's a very good reason to go with a flint gun then. Uh, have I ever shot a mule ear or a side slapper lock? Any thoughts? No, I have not. I've seen them. I've handled them, but I've never actually put a charge through one. You're talking about the one that the hammer swings from the side. Uh, no, I have not. Um, I wish I could give you some thoughts on that. Just having fun, but I haven't shot any. Um, Robert said, okay, awesome. Thanks very much. God's loco said I stumbled on a Remington rolling block. Refreshing my memory of the history would be good. Uh, I'm not that versed in the Remington rolling block as I am in the trap doors, but the long and short of it is they come out during the Civil War in a rim fire with a split breech action, they called it. And after the Civil War, when center fire cartridges come out, they convert it to a center fire action. And they put it in 43 Spanish because the United States does not adopt it when they are backing up to the, uh, I call it the Peabody Trials. The trials of 1865 at the end of the Civil War, the main issue the United States military has with the Remington rolling block is in order to load it, you have to put the hammer on full cock, 
pull the latch all the way open, put your cartridge in, shut it, and you are automatically on full cock. And when firing in lines like they were at the time of the military doctrine, they were worried that guys in the back lines would be shooting guys in the front lines because they couldn't go to a half cock safety, at least not right away. Whereas the trap door, you could put the gun on half cock to load it, which was safe. And then you went to full cock to fire. Uh, they didn't have a safety notch per se on the trap door at the time. It was a two position tumbler. So only half cock and full cock, but half cock had the deep notch. It was perfectly safe to use. That's one of the reasons that the trap door was chosen over the rolling block. The other was the trap door had ejection. And at that point, the rolling block did not. And so you had to stop every time and pluck the shell out and then get your next shell in, whereas that was all one motion with the trap door. Uh, so those were the two main things they were concerned about, safety and the ejection. The other thing that they were a little bit concerned about was the some people were afraid that the action, which there was no worry of it, the action's plenty strong. The cartridge had nothing except for the rolling block behind it if something failed, which that was never going to happen. In 1870, they gave the action of the rolling block to Erskine S. Allen, who invented the trapdoor, and he proceeded to take that in the Springfield Armory and make it to where when you closed it, it would automatically fall to a half cock position, and he also gave it ejection. And so the two main issues were taken care of, and they actually ran from 1870 to 1872, the United States with a complete adoption of a 5070 rolling block trapdoor. The real issue that they wound up having with it was it was just way too expensive to produce. Uh, I think they might have made 10000 in that time period, and they had to go back to hand fitting them because they did not have machinery that would produce that action. Uh, they even actually, surprisingly, I found they converted some 64 and 65 Springfield muzzle loaders. They cut the barrel off and they cut the stock off and they inserted the action in the middle of it and converted those Springfield muzzle loaders to rolling blocks. It was kind of a weird deal. The Navy decided they liked the rolling block, though, no matter what. And so even though the Army dumped it in 1873 to go with the trap door, the Navy held on to their rolling blocks for quite a while. Uh, go check out the video by, uh, by Land and Sea. Uh, he's been on here a few times. He's a naval guy. He does naval firearms history, and he has an entire video on the history of the rolling block in the United States Navy. But after that, the United States is pretty well done with the rolling block, at least for a while. And it winds up going overseas, and it's in the 43 Argentine, 43 Spanish, and 43 Egyptian, I believe. The one I have is 43 Spanish. 43 Spanish is almost identical to 4477 Buffalo cartridge, but not quite. They're not quite interchangeable. And that's pretty well where it found its market was overseas until it became even up to like right before World War I. And I don't know the history of that. It's a CN Arsenal thing. They go to a center fire seven millimeter cartridge in a Remington rolling block. And so... Yeah, that's about all I know about it. It's uh, it's kind of like the AR versus the AK today, where the AK is goes all over the world and becomes everybody's arm except America. America sticks with the uh, AR, and everybody else gets the AK, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, the gun saved Remington as a factory, and it's a very strong action. It gets... In my mind, a lot of people give it more credit than it deserves, to say the least, against the trapdoor, because both of them can handle, both of those guns can perfectly handle 4570 black powder. However, the rolling block can handle big, big cartridges. The rolling block can handle your 5090s, your 5110s. It's a very strong action. So I hope that uh, answers your questions there. I don't know everything about rolling blocks, but I, I know a little, and I've shot quite a few. Uh, definitely the 43 Spanish, mostly. Uh, Vaquero Joel, uh, I had a I had a carbine 4570 once years ago that was made by Petter Soli, and I sold it. I wish I hadn't. Uh, it was kind of a cool little gun. Vaquero Joel said, have you had any trouble with your H&R officer's models? I had two of them, and the thumb latch has given out on both. The first, it was just the set screw that needed modifying. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, and a lot of people, it's kind of funny because... Well, during my research, I kept running across these people who were talking about their trapdoor thumb pieces coming off. 
And the more I read about these, were all 1970s guys, and they weren't talking about originals. They were talking about the H&R models. And some of the H&R models do have trouble with one of the screws that you supposedly have to lock tight in place. But mine has not given us any of that trouble. I think we've probably put about 100 rounds through it. It's not actually mine. It's Caleb's. But we put 100 rounds of the big 500 grains uh, cartridges through it, and I haven't had any trouble whatsoever. I think it's probably an earlier model thing than ours is, but I couldn't guarantee you what it was. But yeah, that's actually a lot of myth about the trapdoor action being weak actually comes from the 1970s and the guys using H&R models that have a, a, a bad setup in the thumb latch that's not on the originals. My current thumb latch piece is broken and needs welding. Yeah, I don't know anything about it other than what I've read and mine's not giving me any fits whatsoever. Uh, let's see. Jolly Jake Lovell said the Hawking in the mountains is like everyone with a Remington model 70 at deer camp. And then the guy with the Rigby shows up. That's exactly right. Everybody with the Remington model 70 is the guys with the smooth boards and the trade rifles and the guy with the Rigby. That's the Hawking. Exactly. And Turkey Creek said, yes, it was Jake that worked at Harper's Ferry. Yeah, I knew it was one of the two, but at one point I was personally going to do a series on the Hawking rifles because I'd heard all the stuff. And so I got the books and I got to digging into it. And I was like, there's just not enough here to actually do a series on because technically in the actual Hawking era, you know, uh, 1823 to 1860, as far as I know, according to Hanson anyway, they only made about 5,000 guns that entire run. And that's just, there's just not a lot of history to go with them. They do change, you know, they go from full stock, obviously flint stocks that look like pennsylvania style rifles you know they go down to the half stocks and the shorter gun shorter barrels but literally so does everybody else in the country at the time so it's just one of those things that i studied it and i was like maybe someday i'll make one video on it but there's just not enough history there to cover everything yes you have your guys that had them you had your bridgers and people like that that had them years later but that was years later <laughs> when they could afford them when they were uh famous enough Franklin Horse said, I have an 1860s English 12-gauge cap lock double barrel at the gunsmith being worked on now. Cool. I have one, too, in 10-gauge. It needs two hammers on it. It was made by Eli Whitney, but it doesn't have any hammers on it. Caleb picked it up in an auction one time. It was a three-trigger, kind of a cool thing. But it's a three-trigger that takes the percussion barrels off with the third trigger. It's kind of a neat thing. Louisiana Gray said, yeah, that's what I had to do three times a day. I go out there and shake it work break it up oh yeah, yeah you're talking about the powder yeah i do it two times uh once in the morning once in the evening and let it run for 24 hours but yeah i've never found anybody it, it doesn't clump in the bottom and i have lifters glued into my jar but it just it's just gonna happen it kind of works its way to the bottom and clumps up yeah yeah louisiana gray yeah for plinking just good enough to have fun yeah iPod Walker said, hey, guys, do you worry if static electric spark might be a problem with the gunpowder? I I don't. I don't graphite it, but I store it in plastic. I have some old metal jars, mostly stored in plastic. Uh, I've never heard of it happening, but that's not saying that it hasn't. But I go ahead and I mill mine in that PVC jar that I have made. And I have a rubber cap on the end of it. It's not screwed on or anything. My rubber cap just sits on there. It's just a, a PVC pipe cap. And I don't even, some people put a hose clamp on it. I've never found the need to do that. That way, if something happens in that, I only do 200 grains and it's in this jar that does not have a well-connected lid. So the lid's on there and it's not just going to fall off. But if it ever blew... It's pointed in a safe direction away from everything else and actually pointed out the door onto a concrete sidewalk. So if whatever was going on in that jar blew, it would be like a 4th of July fountain just shooting out the door. I think there's no way it could build pressure with just that rubber cap and no hose clamp holding the end of it on. Okay. Yeah, Duelist has a good rolling block video. Several guys do. Uh, I have a couple of them, but nothing in depth. Whenever I want to talk about something like I know about it, it's going to be after I've read a few books and The Rolling Block I don't know that much about, just general history. Uh, what would you recommend for... Uh, Robert said, what would you recommend for a beginner's revolver for target shooting? 
Well, that would depend. If you're talking about black powder cap and ball, I say get you a, a 51 Navy is good. Some people like the, the Remington just because it's easier to start with, but it does bind up a little bit more. At least it did for me. I'd start with 36 because it's cheaper to shoot, easier to load. 51 Navy, 36 Remington. If you're talking about a cartridge gun, I would probably go with either the Heritage Rough Rider or the Ruger Wrangler. I personally like the Ruger Wrangler. That's just me. Uh, they're both great guns. If you can afford a little bit more, go up and get you a, a single six, Ruger single six, about 600 bucks. So, but that's where I would start. Uh, cartridge guns, pretty much anything. If you're talking about big bore cartridge guns, pretty much anything from Cimarron, uh, Uberti, Pieta. Well, if you get a Uberti, remember it's probably going to be a three click hammer unless you get Cimarron's old model. Piettas are great guns, and they, as far as the 45 Colt models or the big bore cartridge revolvers, they still have four clicks. Just depends what you want. But for just target shooting for beginners, cap and ball, I'd say start with a 51 Navy. If it was a cartridge gun and you don't, and you're wanting to do something like a 22, I would start with a Ruger Wrangler or a Heritage Rough Rider. Okay, Gage Sunderland Jewett said, a while back you did a serious thing on the different eras of hunting. On the different areas. Okay. A while back you did a serious thing on the different areas of hunting. You did the fur trappers, mountain man, and you said you were going to do a video on the grizzly hunter era before you got to the buffalo. Oh, I don't know if you're talking about me. You might be talking about Duke doing some live streams. We do all that over on Duke's channel now on the, uh, you know, it's on this channel too, but on Duke's channel on the uh, Tales of the Trails. Sorry, I, my mind went blank for a second there. Uh, we didn't do the Buffalo Hunters yet. We did do everything, I think. I, I don't think we did mostly Hunters. We talked about Mountain Men and whatnot. So, yeah, if you want to do grizzly hunting, that would grizzly hunting mainly happened back in the day when the grizzly hunted the guys, and then they wound up hunting the grizzly. I've read a lot of accounts of mountain men saying they see a grizzly in the glen, just leave it alone and go the other direction. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, grizzly hunting I'm sure did happen, but you'd have to talk to Duke about that. Martin Cavanaugh said, "Any tips on unscrewing seized rusted uh, screw off breech?" Uh, let's see. Any tips on unscrewing seized rusted screw off breech loaded pistol barrels? I know heat is necessary. Okay, breech loaded pistol barrels. So, when you say that, I assume you're talking about like a Colt single action army or something like that. It's breech loaded in a pistol barrel. Um, I'm going to have to refer to Snapper on that, even though he's not here. Save it for when we can talk to him. Maybe he'll jump in here. Uh, heat's usually necessary. A gun vice, if that's what you're talking about, uh, a receiver vice. And uh, I really can't give you many tips on it because I don't do it very often. When I have a gun that needs it, uh, I send it to Snapper and have him do it for me. Uh, iPod Walker said, I use brass media and I've never been concerned with it. Yeah, I use lead. I'm actually going to start using brass pretty soon i have it i just haven't had a necessary need to yet for some reason even though i use lead my powder has been clean but i probably will move to brass pretty soon kingdom of vinland says howdy louisiana gray said i don't do more than 100 grams at a time though yeah 200 grams is the most i do too uh it makes about a little uh, i think it's a little over half a pound but yeah that, that, i do it with 200 because that works out easily in the math <laughs> Okay, Gosselico said, thank you. It may follow me home tomorrow. Jonathan Picone said, got a Cimarron 1887 lever action shotgun. Not many videos on them. Your thoughts on it, on if it's an improved PW87? I haven't shot the Cimarron. I've shot the PW87. I have a video out on it, and it needs, I mean, it's, it's a good gun, but it's got a lot of sharp edges with a little work. I've heard that they can be really good. I have not shot the Cimarron 1887. If you want to know about those, I would suggest you go over and comment on uh, Jay Wheeler on his channel. He has all of those. It's just Jay Wheeler. He has all of those guns, uh, all those lever actions. I think he has one of basically all of them, including originals. 
And so he can tell you the differences more than I can. I've only ran the PWA 87. Uh, yeah, Robert, 51 Navy it is. Yeah, and I'd just go ahead and spend a little extra money if you're getting that, get you a good steel frame gun. Pieta, Pieta will last you a long time. It's got the lettering on the side of the barrel, uh, but it's actually got better steel in it, if you ask me, than the Uberti. Uberti looks better on the outside, but the Pieta will stand up to sustain shooting more, in my opinion, and I've shot a lot of them. Uh, I had one with 3,000 rounds through it. Uh, but yeah, if you can't, if you can only afford a brass frame, that's fine. A 36 caliber brass frame will last you a lot longer than most people give it credit for. But a steel frame, that's about the way to go. Steel frame, if you're going to reenact and just carry it a lot, the Uberti is the way to go in my mind. If you're going to actually shoot it a lot, I like Pietas. Uh, Louisiana Gray said, you yeah, can't go wrong with 51 Navy, small amount of less charge and a lot of fun. Yeah, and you'll you'll want to know, you'll want to figure out whether or not you really want to do this before you get too invested. But the 36 is also easier to load, less ring circumference to cut off of that loading lever. And trust me, if you decide you like it, you're going to start investing in all of them. <laughs> before long, you'll have one of every one. A squib load says, good evening. Good evening. But Carol Joel said, thanks. It was quite disconcerting to have a trap door pop open and see that case come flying back at you. That said, the geometry of the action pushes all the gases up into the top of your head. Yeah, I've never had one. I've read a lot about the ones that did pop. And the ones that did pop were the pre-1877s. They had smaller gas ports, thinner, narrower doors. And a couple of them popped due to being extremely overcharged with a heavy bullet when they were first trying out 500 grain bullets. The funny thing was, when they popped, it was not a case of the case pushing back because of the way the trap door sets in there. If the case is slamming back into it, so long as the latch is holding, literally the only thing you're doing is pushing that steel back into the other steel behind it. You're just pushing the door backwards. So what happened that was the absolute worst case scenario for them was a case head separation, gas coming backwards and then up, like you're saying, up toward the top of your head, and it would actually pop the front of the trap before it popped the latch. So it was kind of an interesting thing. So they widened the door in 77, they made the action stronger, and they extended gas ports out the sides so that if you have a case head separation or something happens and you get gas blowback, it'll actually blow sideways both directions and won't pop the door because there's two big gas ports in there but the h and r guns that were made are copies of the earlier guns so they have the narrower doors and no big gas ports so yeah those h and r guns i've heard I, i've heard some people have great success with them the one i have has no problems but i've also heard people have terrible horror stories with them you just got to get them checked out you just got to make sure that thumb latch is doing its job uh, Louisiana Gray said, I do like the 61 better as it has a better loading lever. That is true, but it will cost you a hundred dollars more. So if you want to go for the 61, that's my favorite of all time. Probably the 61 in 36, 61 Navy has a better loading lever, but like I said, it's a little more expensive is all. Arizona Ghost Riders in. Hi, Santee said long day, but I wanted to say hi to all you rogues. Well, just one rogue tonight. I can check my back room here and see if you know, nobody's came in yet. And take care and have a good night. Good night to you, Santi. Mood lines with a round barrel. Okay. Uh, Diane Houston said, hey, Garrett, when's the next Smoke in the Woods? I really enjoyed that. I really enjoy the channel. Uh, yeah, i am I'm been working on it behind the scenes a lot. Uh, my sister has a loom, and, and it's an actual full-size loom from the 1800s and she's got it set up i need to do a little work on it i'd like to do a full episode on her just to kind of explaining how that works that big dude takes up a whole room uh and she got it got it set up and she's been making stuff on it noah has been I, I had to work on some buckskin pants i finally just broke down and bought some that were the correct ones they were very expensive but i bought some instead of doing making it myself because even though those were expensive they were cheaper than making it myself I've uh, been working on some other stuff. I have a plan for my next one. I just haven't had the time to make it. If everything works out right, I'll be doing... Because I've kind of decided to move away from just me talking and shooting and go more to that um, the aesthetic videos, the ambience videos. I really like doing that. 
And so I'm probably going to be releasing them once every two weeks or so. My next one I have in mind to do is uh, a pork loin on an open fire and with some other things involved, uh, wood cutting with a, uh, actually got a 10-foot cross-cut saw that's a two-man. No one I'll be running that. Uh, got a, Ethan bought an original 1800 skewing axe. Be bringing that out on that channel. So I've got all kinds of ideas. I have to wait for the wind to quit blowing and me to get a little bit of time to do it. But I'm hoping it all works out okay. I might be able to do it this Sunday and hopefully release it sometime next week. Uh, yes, Robert said lead is ridiculous expensive these days. Yeah, go down to your... Uh, when I did it, I actually had a bunch of lead to start with as I got lucky. You don't want to use wheel weights if you're loading it in a 51 Navy because that stuff's hard to load because you got to cut a ring. Go down to your local scrap yard and just ask them if they got four or five pounds of lead. And if you're only shooting one 51 Navy, that'll last you a long time casting if you want to cast. Otherwise, yeah, it's pretty expensive to just buy a round ball. Oh, Louisiana Gary said, yes, it is Robert. That's what makes the 36 such a great choice. I use battery cable lead ends from my brother's shop and make my own. Yeah, that's that's making your own is the best way to do it. But you may not want to invest in all that when you're starting out until if you find out whether or not you're really going to like it or not. Hiram Hillbilly said, I have a new U-Birdie 1861 Navy Black Powder Revolver, 36 caliber, 7.5. Colt, second gen 1851 barrel showed up on ebay what are the chances it would have for the uberti actually pretty good depending on the era of the second gen you're talking about because early early second gens the first handful run of them if, if i recall right i could be wrong here are made really really close to spec uh they were uberti rough cast parts brought into the Colt factory and then made it Colt. And then as the second gen wears on a few years, I think it's either two or three years later, they start making them in the Ivor Johnson factory, but to the same spec. Now, from what I understand, you know, you do your own research on this, that whole second gen run. I, I don't know if I want to say that. I, I understand that there were Huberti castings used there, but don't quote me on it because as soon as I do, somebody will say Ivor Johnson made the frames in the Ivor Johnson factory for the black box uh, second gen navies. So I don't know. I wouldn't be scared to try it. If nothing else, you know, <laughs> retap it for whatever thread that is. So Franklin Horse said, I just bought an original 1987. In 1887, do you get a chance to view it in the link I posted in the comment section of your PW87 video? Uh, no, probably not. Uh, when I moved on to Smoke in the Woods, I set all my computer stuff up to take the comments from that channel, which there's not a lot of. And Ethan is now taking all the comments on 11 Bang Bang, unless I happen to go clear over there and reset everything to look at that channel. And he's been gone for a few days, so I'll have to go over there and actually physically look now because I'm no longer getting notifications that a comment comes up on 11 Bang Bang. So if you guys are commenting on those videos, first of all, I need to explain to people, if it's a reply, I never got to see those anyway for some reason. The way Google was working when they would email me the comments, they never showed me the replies. They'd just say you have a reply. If I clicked on it, it went away. So if I didn't know what video it was on, I could never find it. But... As of right now, I'm not actually answering the comments over there unless you, like you just mentioned. I will go look that up and take a look at it when I get a chance here. Let's see. Turkey Creek 1823 said, Smoke in the Woods is the only channel I have a notification bell turned on. Well, I'm glad you do because hopefully I'm going to get some more turned out over there. I'm, I didn't want to go into that channel wanting to build it per se. Uh, but I just, to be quite honest, there was a lot of infighting going on in the comment sections on 11 Bang Bang, which is to be expected. We're at 30,000 plus subscribers. And I was getting emails and comments and everybody was going after and I, and it got to where it wore on me for a while. And after three years or so of it, I realized I was spending more time looking through a camera lens than I was actually looking at nature. 
or going out and shooting. And I was so worried about it. So for the last month, I've been doing everything. And I have used my phone on some things, you know. But I'm not pushing myself. I'm relaxing. I'm enjoying it over there on that channel. I've started watching a channel that I'll plug here, uh, The Woodland Escape. If you guys haven't seen The Woodland Escape, you've got to watch it. The guy's uh, 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 Peter Kelly. He's up in Canada. Uh, he's built a building a fort. He's built cabins. He builds guns. He builds everything. But it's always kind of just an, a very slow, relaxed, ambiance sort of videos. And I was watching that, and I was like, that's what I want to do for a while. And Ethan was coming back, so I just let him have this one. And it turns out once we split the channels, neither of us have time to make videos for either channel. So that's kind of where we're at. And it may grow over there. It may not. It doesn't bother me that much. Noah and I were just having fun. And like I said, we spent the last several weeks making stuff, making shooting bags and buckskins and and moccasins. And I actually have a set of moccasins here that we took a Sunday afternoon when I would normally be filming for 11 Bang Bang. And Noah and I sat down, and I know they look a little rough, but these are hard sole plains moccasins. And we did that out of some German tanned buckskin. And we made those. And then the next Sunday, we made a shoot, uh, uh, some uh, canvas haversacks, not shooting bags, bigger haversacks. And right now, he's over there working on a Beltax sheath. Uh, I rehandled a Beltax. Uh, all kinds of fun stuff we've been doing. We need to get some more of it on film. But when we come back, we'll be pretty historically accurate to 1810 to 1830. And that's where we want to be. Okay. Uh, Franklin Horse said, now I need to find some 12 gauge brass shells to load. Uh, Magtech shells, uh, by I think it's called Ballistic Products, they usually have them for a very good price, just empty brass. Uh, Hiram Hillbilly would have fit. Oh, would it fit? <coughs> I don't know. Like I said, uh, you're talking about that 51 Navy barrel. I think it would, but I couldn't guarantee it. Chris Klein said, hello, all. Uh, Tim O'Neill said, hi, guy. Missed the last one, but left a bunch of notes for Duke to make it. Okay. Uh, Levi Lamb said, Midway has 12-gauge brass. Cool. But Carol Joel said, mine, the latch gave way. I was shooting 70 grains with 350-grain bullet. Held it for about... It held for about 50 to 60 grains. Okay, gotcha. So that was your uh, H&R, I assume. Uh, thinking about boring up to 50 from a 41, 44 brass frame, 51 Navy with a, oh, thinking about boring it up to 50? Boy, I feel like you'd be getting that cylinder awful thin at 50 yeah, for a 51 Navy and 44. Uh, don't let anybody ever tell you though, either that Colt never made a 44 caliber 51 Navy and he did. Yes. There was only about 10 of them, 40 and 44 caliber. Yes. They were only prototypes, but like I told Jake the other day, it's categorically incorrect. to say that Colt never made a 44 caliber 51 Navy because he did make a handful of them. Okay. Turkey Creek 1823 says, ha ha. Very funny. The wind quit blowing. <laughs> oh, that's like, yeah, Turkey Creek's not too far from my country. Here lately, it's been all day, every day. Hopefully, midsummer it'll start. It'll be so hot you can't light a fire, but we'll be <laughs> at least the wind will go away. One time, I asked a buddy of mine, "When do you think the wind will quit blowing?" It was about March. He said, "Oh, about October." <laughs> I said, "You're probably about right." Uh, Keith said, "You're not kidding about the wind. It makes offhand a real challenge." Yeah. And it just, I don't like to light a fire in Kansas with any wind. <laughs> you don't know, and I don't want to be out there fighting it. And since it's smoke in the woods, it almost requires a fire to make a video. Uh, Brandon Burke said, a little off topic, what topic, what is your funniest results from loading your own ammunition? Reload a bunch of 4570 black powder cartridge and had some interesting results. Well, not necessarily funny, but... Uh, Got on video when I reloaded a bunch of that 43 Spanish with uh, modern made 43 Spanish brass, and they sent us some bad brass in there, and I had case head separation on Duke in the middle of the video. He had the poof, black face <laughs> all over. <laughs> he said, hey, guys, something happened. Something went wrong. And I was like, oh, that's not good. He opened it up, and only the case head came out. 
you got to be careful of uh, modern produced 43 Spanish cases. I don't know what they did wrong, but that batch we had, we had three of them that were bad. Uh, other than that, reloading black powder, I've never really had any issues. Uh, black powder is pretty hard to mess up. Uh, Franklin Horse said 1887. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about your shotgun. Louisiana Gray said, well, I sure enjoy watching you and Noah over there. We'll be doing some more pretty soon. Like I said, we've been spending all the windy Sunday afternoons that, you know, we can't do anything else that we actually have an afternoon to do it. We're in there making stuff for the channel. So that's, 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 it'll be coming when the wind quits blowing, it'll get more frequent. Like TC said, that probably never happened. Uh, let's see. Martin Cavanaugh said single shot antique pocket pistols like a Derringer, but screw barrel with powder chamber. You place the ball on top and then rescrew the tube. The old ones arrive seized solid with rust. Oh, okay. The only thing I've ever had like that's that Queen Anne's pistol and it wasn't seized up. Um, once again, I'm going to have to refer you to Snapper on that because he does that kind of thing all the time. If it was me doing it, and I absolutely, if it was an antique and I absolutely had to shoot it and I couldn't get it undone, it would require heat. But I would be worried about changing the color of the barrel to the point where I'd have to refinish it. And so, once again, maybe soaking it in diesel for a few days might work. Um once again, I got to refer to Snapper on it. Because like I said, if I have something that seized up, I send it to him. <laughs> so, uh, your comment got deleted. Well, I didn't even use a swear. I haven't deleted any comments, Squib. I don't know of anybody else that has. The only other person in here that's got a wrench was AR American. Huh. What comment was it? Comment it again. Maybe I'll see it. Because I sure didn't see your first one. Uh, Desert Rat 45, I actually have three 12-gauge brass, three 12 gauge brass shells, Remington UMC. Cool. Off subject, but I'm curious, Kent says, do you think reloading your own ammo is becoming obsolete with this new generation? Uh, no. I, I, I think it's becoming more prevalent ever since 2020. Uh, I know I've been into it a lot more, and just about everybody I know that's shooting at least in massive quantities, is either shooting muzzle loaders or if they're shooting cartridges, they're hand loading for them. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, I have to stop and think of the name now. Oh, my, uh, Dylan. Dylan Presses has had banner years the last couple of years. So I don't think it's going away. I think it's becoming more and more common, especially the better the presses get and the easier it gets. Okay, Squibload said, I commented that the Lamat was a good starter black powder revolver. Okay. I I couldn't comment to that because I never even had the Lamat yet. Um, but yeah, I I didn't delete it. I don't know if anybody else did. But yeah, that's if you think go over and check out Squibload's video on the Lamat video. Okay. Ba -ba -ba. Okay, Tim O'Neill said. Hey, hey! Hey! I'm not alone anymore. I've been rescued. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Sorry it took me so long. That's You're okay. running a little late, but I'm here. I made it. I was having lots of fun, but there's a couple questions in here that are just for you. Uh, uh -oh. Martin Cavanaugh uh, says he's... Hold on one second. My mic is not working yet. Um, give me just a second, and I'll finish, fix this. Problemo. Adio. Are you there? Garrett? Yep. Can you hear me? I can hear you. One moment. Okay. I'm close. <laughs> I'm so close. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, I'm good. We're good. Okay. Martin Cavanaugh had two questions, and and we're referring to guns that are like the Queen Anne's pistol, but may, a Derringer, anything. Screw barrel pistols, right? Single shot, screw okay. barrel pistol. He got one in. It's seized with rust. Or an antique. I think it's an antique. 
He said, uh, single shot antique pocket pistols like Derringer, but screw barrel with a powder chamber. You place the ball on top and screw the tube. The old ones arrive seized with rust, and he's wanting to know what we would do to unseize that. I think preferably okay. without ruining the finish. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this. There are several steps you're going to have to try to take. One, regular penetrating lube. Lube it up, let it sit for a day or two, then try it again. Put it in a vise with leather on each side. Like nice thick, like, uh, what's the name of that? Uh, veg tan leather. And so you can squeeze on it pretty good without hurting it or hurting the finish. And then try to walk it back and forth very slowly, back and forth. And if that doesn't work, your other option is throw it in a, uh, a pot of boiling water, distilled boiling water. Let it sit in there and just boil for a while. That'll eat off that rust as well. And then try it with the in the vice with the leather. If that doesn't work, the guaranteed way of getting it off is you're going to have to heat that joint up with a torch. And a little bit of a, you heat it and then quench it. You don't want to get it too hot. Um, because what you you don't want to do is, depending on if it's, if, it's, if it's wrought iron, you don't have to worry about it. Because it's not heat treated anyways. But if it is a, a steel barrel with any kind of, uh, you know, carbon material made out of it, a harder carbon material, you can make the barrel too hard by quenching it. So if you do quench it, if you have to go that route to quench it, go ahead and heat it back up to a, uh, like kind of, you're going to have to, you're probably going to lose your, most of your finish, but at least a spot where you can polish it. And then you're going to want to heat it up to almost a bluish color and then quench it. And then it'll be back to a spring so then you can actually use it like a barrel without having to worry about it exploding. Um, the biggest thing with temper is, is you don't want to soft is okay, but hard is bad because that can be a catastrophic failure. You just don't want the metal to get too hard. Um, but if it's wrought iron, you don't have to worry about it. It's not going to get hard really. So, but if you get to the extreme of using a torch, I would guess you're probably going to have to refinish your barrel. Yeah. But if you, that's what you got to do, it's what you got to do. It's what you got to do, yeah. E either way, you get to a point where it's, you know, you have to, to weigh those options. Do you want a shootable gun? or? And the thing, too, is if it's rusted solid, screw the finish. Look, I know it sounds horrible, but that means there's rust in those threads eating the gun alive. Mm -hmm. Even though it might fix that issue, because you could always create, uh, you know, like using a, a rust bluing method. And a little bit of polishing here and there and a little bit of roughing up stuff to make it look like an original finish. But that's the finish is the least important thing when it comes to rust. It's great to try to save that finish. And that's what the best part about boiling it in distilled water is you're going to retain this the finish. It's there. Mm -hmm. um, but if it gets to the point where you have to heat it, just do it because you're just letting the gun die. If you don't, mm -hmm. most people are too scared to even do that. And would you rather have a gun that's dying and not going to be around in 50 years? Or do you want, you know, with its original finish, but gone in 50 years or without its original finish, but it's still around. It's yeah. You got to weigh those options. And sometimes there's no good answers. Usually they suck. Yeah. Uh, there was one other question. A guy who has had a Uberti uh, frame, the way I understand it, 51 Navy. And he, mm -hmm. he was looking at a second gen uh, 51 Navy barrel. Uh, do you know if that thread would match? We're talking about a 51 Navy. Yeah, a second gen with a Uberti frame. You know, I don't I don't know. It, sh it might. I've heard that's what I said. I think it would, because I've I heard think those it are would. made out of Uberti castings, but but I think the second gens though, they're also um they're closer to like the uh the diameter pin and whatnot is closer to the original Colt. Yeah. Um uh, I think what you're gonna run into is either the arbor's gonna be too long, the arbor's gonna be too short. Or the arbor pin is either going to be too small or the arbor pin is going to be a little bit too big. Um, if it's too big, no big deal because that's the arbor pin for uh, Uberti. So, you know, polish a little bit off to get that barrel to fit. He did, he did say 51 Navy. Somehow in my head, I was picturing a second gen 73. And I just said 51, so I remembered it. So I was saying threads, right? And I, was I was like, like threads. Oh, wait, there is no threads on the 51 Navy. For some reason in my head, I was thinking 73. Uh, let's see. There was a few. You could make it fit. You could make anything fit. Just. Well, don't you have an original with a Uberti barrel? You know, I do, but it's <laughs> kind of. 
Oh, yeah, you didn't see nothing. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'm stretching my arm. <laughs> Please don't do that to us. At yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm glad you caught me. Um, let's see. I have, yes. Um, I'm trying to remember what I had to do to fit it, fit it though. The one that had that, that Dan tap at the back, that's what I put a Uberti barrel on that for a while. Um, I remember it pretty much going in. I think the little pins at the bottom of the frame, I had to shape in those a little bit. I think they were a tiny bit too big, if I remember. Um, but try it. Just give it a shot. Stick it on there and see what it needs. It's You can fix it. If the arbor pin's too big, it's not a big deal. You can always unscrew that arbor. That arbor unscrews. There's a pin in the back on the back of the frame. You got to drill out the little retaining pin, and then that arbor can unscrew. You can remake an arbor, make an arbor bigger. You can add to that arbor. You can shorten that arbor. You can lengthen that arbor. Whatever you got to do to make it work. And being it's a Uberti part, who cares? You know, it's not like you're modifying a real Colt. Mm -hmm. Tim O'Neill, I think he's talking about when I was talking about the 44 caliber 51 Navy. He said, did they make it? They buy proper cast bullets from Hornady. Yeah, they made it. They made a 44 caliber 51. Yep. Does it look exactly? It has a fluted no. cylinder. It's a fluted cylinder with more of a Griswold and Gunnison style barrel. It's a 51 Navy barrel. They just, after the rounded it, rounded it. Yeah. But the 40 caliber one looks just like a 51 Navy. It does, yes. So, yeah, they do exist. Uh, I'm telling you, I, I kind of want to get myself a. Uh, like a Uberti 51 Navy and turn it into one of those 44, make it look just like the real one. That'd be kind of fun. Just to trip people up. Navy 1860. Oh, no. That would actually, that would have been perfect. So all I need to do is get a 44 caliber 51 Navy barrel and round it. Exactly. That's all you really have to do and put the Navy grips on it. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm thinking a carbine, a wider carbine with a 12 inch barrel. I think they made a smooth bore on a 51 Navy with a 12 inch barrel. I don't know if they made a smooth. They might have. They made what they called a they did crazy cartridge gun, but it wasn't actually a 51 Navy uh, uh, cartridge. They made what they called a carriage gun, but that was a 73. Yeah, I would, I, would, stock. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody made a 51 Navy 12 inch back then, because in the words of Duelist, yeah. if you had the money, they'd make you one with an 18 foot long barrel if you wanted it to. They sure would. <laughs> Um, it wouldn't shock me. Like that, those kind of things don't shock me. If we, yeah. I'm sure you you might be able to find one or two with like just outrageously long barrels, well, or I mean, even outrageously short barrels. The Colt did it. There is a 51 Navy car. Uh, is it Manhattan Arms that made the 51 Navy carbine? Yes. And I mean, I'm. Sure and there's also a Belgian a Belgian company that did it too. Like it, most of the ones that I've seen are Belgian. The ones I've seen in person, but I think it's, is it either Manhattan Arms or what's the name of the other one? Um, Metropolitan. Yes. Might be the Metropolitan. I'm not, I, I got to look at that. But it looks like a 51 Navy that was turned into a carbine, a longer barrel, and it actually has a stock on it where they just remade it. So it actually has a stock stock. How it, it actually looks really cool. Uh, the barrel on that was. I would say at least 18 inches, if not closer to 24 inches. Yeah. And by the way, guys, we're talking about copies of 51 navies that were made side by side, contemporary with original 51 navies. Yes. We're yeah, you you could have had this in the 18 or 18 late 1850s, early 1860s, all day long. So if you've got a 60 Army or 51 Navy carbine walking around in 1865, people aren't going to look at you sideways because they did exist. They did exist. Uh, they weren't necessarily the Colt variety, but they looked just like the Colt variety. You'd have to look. Oh yeah, the difference. If I didn't show you the where they they stamped the brevet on it, mm -hmm. I mean it even says Colt. Believe it or not, it just says Colt brevet, mm -hmm. meaning that it's Colt licensed it to be made in another place or allowed the people to hey pay me a little royalty and I'll let you sell it, kind of thing. And uh, yep, just the whole world of brevets are interesting. It's actually kind of a fun topic as well because there's so many different neat changes that were made by different companies that fell under the Colt Brevet. And uh, those carbines are one of them. I, I have a, 
I think it's my video on the first year of me going to the Las Vegas Antique Arm Show. Uh, the 2022, I believe. It has one of those in there. I, I saw it. I, re I really wanted it, too. <laughs> no, I think it'd be pretty neat. Forever we talked about making one, and then I moved on to flint locks, and I haven't looked back because I can't afford the caps. Man, I'm <laughs> telling you, the cap shortage really killed my interest in cap and ball rollers. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, I'm hoping it'll it'll go away soon. It. I need to. I've been wanting. To, I've really been dying to get back with doing some gun stuff myself. Yeah. And we did have a question earlier that was one we get quite often, but you can go ahead and answer your version of it. What's a good starter cap and ball revolver? <sighs> good starter cap and ball revolver. I'm gonna have to say it like every single time. An original first model for good. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. <laughs> um, honestly, a 51 Navy or a 49 Pocket. They're great. A 49 Pocket, you can shoot forever cheaply because you can even use the little, um, uh, what? It's like double lot buck. It's the same size. But bear in uh, mind that the reproductions of the 49 Pocket model are terrible usually. That is true. You're, you're going to need to add a couple extra springs to that, that hammer spring and do some work to that gun because you're going to want to put better nipples on it and then better springs and it's a decent gun. But um, out of the box, if you don't want to work on it, you don't want to touch it, the best I could say would be a 51 maybe. It'd yeah. probably be the easiest. Or an 1860 Army, just a little bit more um, oomph to it. <laughs> it's a little bit more pricier in powder and ball. Yeah. That was kind of the conclusion we came to. Uh, everybody's saying hi, Snapper. Squibblood commented that the Lamat is a good starter black powder revolver. <laughs> Speaking of Lamat, I got to get that back to him. Oh, okay. man. Uh, Carrie Stottlemyre said, we can hear you, Snapper. Angelica Witt says, hi. 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 Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. I think, uh, Tim O'Neill said, I think the savings on 300 blackout, a whole groups at less than 20.25, around some four men ammo costs $54 for 20. Whew. That's why I don't shoot modern rifles very much anymore. Me uh, Timber Drifter said that was a close one. I don't remember what he's referring to. Plus, we're using that really weird, strange, smokeless powder thing that eh, it's a fad. It'll, it'll go away. You know, kids these days, their weird, smokeless powder. Let's see. Did they make a 51 Navy smoothbore? Not to my knowledge of production wise, but there's a lot of them that are smooth now. <laughs> that's a perfect answer. As a matter of fact, that's like the perfect answer. I was going to say the same thing. Um, okay. I don't think they did, but it would. You know what? I actually, I'm thinking of it. I think they did. Um, and it was like a snake pistol. It was meant for loading it almost like a shotgun for snakes. Hmm. I remember reading that somewhere. Uh, Probably a prototype or something. It I'm might have been a prototype. Never yeah. went into production. I've never seen an advertisement for it. Uh Let's see. Uh, let's see. Howdy, everyone. Oh, that must be Ethan on 11. Bang, bang. Said howdy, everyone. Hi, Louisiana, Ethan. Louisiana Gray said, give me a good evening to you, Ethan. Oh, uh, let's see. Warning. Let's see. What would be the load for my Uberti Walker? 60 grains all day, son. <laughs> 50 90 grains. grains and a 200 and a 300 grain <laughs> conical. If you want to be, yeah, if you want to be actually historical about it, 30 to 40 grains in a good heavy 200 to 260 grain conical or 50 grains in a round ball. If you want to load 60, you can, but that's not the way it was ever suggested to do it. I still think the uh, NRA curator has it right. 90 and a two or 300 grain uh, Turkey Creek 1823 said, so who made my black box 1860 army? I think the first runs weren't considered the black box. Uh, the black box that I know of is also called the F series. Anything made from second gen made from 68 to 77. I can't remember. Don't quote me on that. Duelist but, has a great video on yeah. this topic, actually. I think if it's a black box like my Walker, it's for sure probably made in the Ivor Johnson factory, but made mm -hmm. exactly to spec 
of the original Colt gun. Except for one thing. One god awful thing is I've never seen a black box that actually had progressive rifling. Mm, pretty sure mine does. Does it? Now don't go touch it now. Just a second and I'll let you know. Because uh, I had this conversation with a couple people and every time I'd pick up a gun to look at it, like a uh, 49 pocket or 51 Navy black boxes I've looked at, they had regular style um, rifling. They didn't have the progressive or game twist rifling. Because that, that actually shocked me. I was actually upset to learn that. Are you still there? I didn't hear what you said before. Oh, yeah. Um, the ones that I've looked at, the 51 Navies, uh, I've looked at a 51 Navy, a 49 Pocket, and a Pocket Navy, um, second gens, and none of them had gain rifling in them. Were they all the short barrel variety? You no. said 51 Navy. Yeah, 51 Navy, regular standard seven and a half inch barrel. Let me check because I, I thought it did, but this might be important to see. This is interesting. I would like to know because the ones I've seen didn't, but I've only seen a couple. I mean, I don't know if there's. Oh, that, you know. that dude is progressive as the day is long, I think. Let me send you a picture, Snapper, and then you can yes. look at it. Oh, well, if you take a picture and let the gun down, we should be able to. Look at well, I'll look at it together, right? So I know he's holding it. I don't know. Uh, I got in trouble for a video of holding a gun once. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Those silly, silly bone sticks. Let's see. All right. That's interesting. Should be coming your direction. Let me turn my camera back on. Now, right, one sure moment. This together. Pardon me while I build a firearm behind the scenes here. <laughs> um, I always notice the best way to see it is if you're looking at the breech going to the... Um, yeah, the that, that's what I said. Yeah. Usually if you go from the tip of the barrel towards the breech, it's hard to tell. It, it's just kind of messing with your eyes. I'll let you know when it gets here. I haven't looked at the original rifling on any of our originals for a little bit, but that's not saying anything. I know that the 51 Navy, the 1860 Army, all they start off straight. I'm talking like straight, straight for like a good inch and a half. Yeah. Okay, hold on. I got it here. Oh, I can't tell, Garrett. Uh I don't know. It kind of does. I mean, it's straight almost to the last half inch of barrel. That's interesting, bro. Um, so maybe I'm right. We need, to, we need to do some research on that. I'm pretty sure, though, back to the original thing. If it's a black box, it's probably made out of a 300-page manual two-spec in the Ivor Johnson factory. Yeah, I heard they're really, like, they, they, they did a great job on those second gens. Yeah, they're, they do. They're, the... they're kind of like the second gen single action armies. They shoot better than the first gens because they're not wore out. And they shoot better than the modern ones because they're made like the first ones. <laughs> um, and they actually have real color case hardening instead yeah. of the stuff that you see. It, it's, it's one of those things that you don't notice that until you actually start dealing with real color case hardening. And then every time you look at a replica, you can spot it from a mile away. And American Walnut Grips. Yep. Um, let's see. The Best Badness said, have some number 10s, referring to caps, but I don't even want to touch them. <laughs> yep, me neither. I think we're all there. And you can make them yourself, but I never have. They're very fiddly, and it takes a long time, and they're very fiddly. To make, like For me to enjoy it back in the day, I would have gone out and shot 200 rounds in a Sunday. Or, mm -hmm. you know, 30 rounds in a day. I got something from Turkey Creek here. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, Turkey Creek, you got the uh, same black box as I do. And those are F-Series guns, and I'm pretty sure... I did the research once. Those are made in the Ivor Johnson factory, but finished in the Colt factory and made two Colt specs. 
Yep. That's, that's how I re- remember it as well from the little research I've done. I know Duelist 18, what, or 1954? Is that his? It, yeah, Duelist. Duelist. Yeah, um, he has a really good video series on talking about the second chance. Matter of fact, if you have the black box or anybody else in this that can hear this has a black box, second gen, look down the barrel and see if it's got progressive rifling as well. I'm now I'm that's really not near curious. As fast as twist as my birdies and piettas. Yeah. Normally you can see the twist. Now, like I said though, if you're looking towards the you know the tip of the barrel towards the breech, it's really hard to tell. It, it kind of messes with your, your sight, but if you look from the breech towards the tip of the barrel, you can see it. It starts off nice and straight and then it gets really like tight yeah that picture at the end it was from the breach to the end right okay it kind of looks like it but i i can't tell i can't tell but you're seeing it with your eyes so you probably can yeah i mean i feel like it is but i've been known to be wrong uh yeah louisiana gray said yeah good luck getting at uh, reproduction pockets to shoot right uh i found out that the 62 pocket Navy? No, which one do you have? The Navy. Okay, so the 62 Pocket Police from Uberti was probably the most junk cap and ball revolver. The arbor was too short. The hammer was too light. The action felt like you were dragging it over boulders. That was bad, and I've never even taken the time to fix it. I just cleaned it and put it back on the shelf. I mean, I actually it, it was a gun I need to get. Done every time. Yeah, that's a shame too. I, I really think they put the the nipples are too big on those guns. I think the the firing cone in the center of those nipples are too big. Plus the the, the hammer spring is far too light, far too light. Uh, Tim O'Neill said dual purpose fifty one navy with shot or ball barrel loaded, either shot or skin cartridges with ball cartridges. Cool. Ethan said easy to fix the cap shortage. Get a Collier revolver. <laughs> Uh, Louisiana Gray said, so Garrett, you don't make your own caps? I started to. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it just wasn't going to be feasible for me. So I literally just started shooting flintlocks. And after I got a really good Kibler flintlock, I never looked back because I had just as much fun shooting the Kibler for a whole lot less money than I was shooting that cap and ball revolver. And it was even easier to clean. I have to pull all the nipples on it. Well, uh, the way I say it, if you've never made your caps before, it's one of those things that you think wouldn't take that long, but you start making them and an hour's pass and you barely have 60 made. Yep. It's one of those situations. It's, it's low. It's tedious because it's really small parts. Getting it all lined up, it, it takes you a good two, three minutes per. And before you know it, you spend hours and you don't have that much to show for it. I tell and you they're what, not even that not, like, They're not that great. They work. Don't get me wrong, but they're not great. You know, everybody says load five in your cap and ball to be safe. I was really safe. By the time I was done shooting it, I was loading one. <laughs> then I'd reload just to slow the cap consumption down. Because, you, I mean, I can make caps last all day long on a single shot rifle, but a six shooter revolver, oh, I missed. Or I hit, oh, I can do that again. You blow through six caps, you know, and you're like, well, let's do that again. Then you exactly. blow through 12 in the time it would take you to blow through two on a rifle. <laughs> okay, Josh Harris said, is there a good resource to learn how to make caps out there? Yes, there is. It's called Snappers Antique Firearms Unlimited. He has a oh, video no. on how to do it. It's, pretty it's good. an old video. Don't judge me. It's old. I need to make a new one. <laughs> uh, there's a tool you buy, and it, it's you, know, you basically use cans, like, you know, like a beer can or soda can. Cut it out, and you kind of put it in this tool, and you hit it from the top, and these little, they look like the caps come out the bottom. And uh, the little um, cap guns you buy at Walmart, like little kid cap guns, fire them in the strips, and then use a hole puncher to punch out the, the little circles. And you just drop them in there with a little bit of, uh, what's the name of that glue I was using? It's for sh- people use it for shotgun, too. It's like water something. A, a really thin, light, light, light glue on top, mm-hmm. and that's it. And then you can start putting, usually I have to put two, maybe three of those little round dots from a cap ball or a little cap gun uh, in those. And that's it. Or the better route is to buy matches and break the heads of the matches off and then scrape the, the, the stuff on the side of the box into that. Lightly fold it around and now you have an impact, very impact sensitive, powerful powder. 
and you put that in there instead of using the little cap gun cap yep. cappers things. Martin Cavanaugh talking about getting that barrel loose. That sounds good, Snapper. Barrels are pitted rusty anyway. It's been boiling, but I see the gas torch coming out. <laughs> do what you got to yes. do. Do what you got to do, brother. I'll close my eye. No, I'm just kidding. Yep. Uh, Josh, you, like, you'll be amazed what kind of finish you can you can still retain, even if you have to go to the heat and beat method. Yep. Just take your time and don't, you know, try to protect it as best you can. But it's much better to have a gun that isn't dying than a gun that is dying. That's pretty. Yep. Joshua Harris said, okay, thanks. I'll check it out. I'm learning powder production. If I can get caps sorted, I'd be set. I think we all would be. It just depends you on can the do kind it. of time and patience you have. <laughs> that, that's the big thing, just time and patience. About how many would you say you could make an hour? About 60, maybe 70. Mm. It's slow. You could shoot them faster than you could make them. Oh, way faster. Mm, yeah. Uh, iPod Walker said, did anyone ever figure out conical shaped bullets for the revolutionary period rifles? Not necessarily mini ball type ammo. Hmm, that's a good question. That's a good question. I don't know of it personally, but you never, whenever, if I were to say, no, they never did. Somebody would be able to jump on here. Well, this German gun from 1610 yeah. was loaded with a hammer and no patch and a conical in a, a Whitmer style twist. <laughs> It'll be something like that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, if they did, they definitely weren't common. Let's put it that way. I don't think so, but I could not say for sure that it did not happen. Uh, Man, it's nice being back on this. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. He said, if you see my this, I have the pattern 1776 rifle kit in my possession. Okay, he's talking to somebody else. Uh, Badness said, I thought Doulas said his signature series Navy had progressive rifling. He may have. I'm, he I'm may have. Scared. I just, I personally haven't seen that though. I, uh, it's, I could be wrong. It's been like four years since I've studied that section of Colt. That was back in the, because he started the progressive rifling clear back in the Dragoons. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been almost four years since I made that video. Uh, Joshua Harris said, I've made one pound of powder so far. It's in puck form at the moment. Good luck. And just remember, if you don't get it right the first time, don't get discouraged. Keep trying. Most of us, our first pound of powder is not something we look back on fondly. <laughs> nope. It went kaboom, but it wasn't very good kaboom. Yep. Uh, let's see. Good luck. Okay, yeah, iPod Walker and Hammer still talking. Uh, let's see. Tim O'Neill said that is the worst advice for a new new shooter. Cheapest brass frame you like, Graf and Sons for one thousand caps for one hundred and twenty five dollars. Three cans of pellet proper. I've also mm -hmm. trusted CVA my brass frame forty four. I he didn't finish. Oh, he's probably saying about the Dragoon. Oh, well, duh. yeah, it was yeah. a joke. It was a joke. That's a joke. If that's joke. what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, Brandon Birch said, had the army Arbor fell on Army Sam Walker Walker my first time shooting it. It was loaded with 50 grains in a round ball, and she let loose on the third shot. And first, when I saw the barrel flying down range, now, Snapper has yeah. Army Sam Marco Walker. Yeah, it's actually behind me, right behind my hat. And it's got a beautifully long stock on it. <laughs> Skeleton stock. There is nothing cooler than a walker with a stock. I'm telling you, you've got to have one. <laughs> you're, you're not part of the Cookie Club without one. I'm telling you, you're going to think. Them, when I was looking for them, they were nowhere to be found. And these are the cheap ones, right? This yeah. is the skeleton stock. They're actually made for the single action army. Um, matter of fact, that's why I got that one, because I have a longer barreled single action army I wanted to put it on, but... ATF rules. <laughs> so I was like, hey, I'll just throw it on the walker. That sounds like fun. And I love it. I think that stock was 120 something bucks, if I remember right. They're fairly cheap. You can find them on uh, Gunbroker quite often. Yeah, Bert, Brandon Burke said, I thought I had a chain fire, but the last three were still loaded. And of course, I didn't have any tools to properly unload. So I switched hands and had a pepper box walker. <laughs> that's pretty good that's, that's awesome. pretty good oh yeah 
Okay. My 62 police was loose when I got it, and it was a new Cimarron, but I repaired it myself before I even shot it. Yeah, they, they're they're pretty terrible. Like I said, I could have got the one I had going better, but I'd already made the video. I was kind of disgusted with it, and I was in one hand I had that one. In the other hand, I had Staffer's original, which I had gone through 70-plus shots without even a cap jam, and they were all hitting really good, and I was like, that. <laughs> Toss the other one away. Clean, cleaned it and put it away. It's it's there just to complete the collection for the most part. Um, you will be into that for half the cost of a cheap phone. At least you can shoot as much as you want. Cast proper size bullets. These guys are right most of the time when they talk about and he, He's still talking about the Dragoon. He must not yeah. have got your sarcasm. It was a joke. And the reason I say that is because, believe it or not, one of the very first... Like, well, the first real original cap and ball I ever bought, and I only had a 1860 Army Pieta before it, and I only had it for like a week, is when I bought that stupid first model. Well, it's not stupid, but the, my original first model for June. So technically, it kind of up there with, I can kind of say, because I only shot that 1860 Army once. And then my very next gun I was shooting that was cap and ball was an original first model for June. You know, like you do. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Louisiana Gray said, yes, indeed. I think they use the factory nipples for the regular size guns. How to replace mine with had to replace mine with Tresco nipples. They work much better. Guns and water said, hi guys, snapper. Do you own any flintlock or percussion powder power testers? I think I sent you a picture of one of those not very long ago. The little Derringer looking things. It's got the little deal on it and you pop the powder and it tells you how powerful it was. It's a historic thing. No, but I want one now. Uh, there was one on Gunbroker for a hundred bucks a month ago. I think I, I might have sent it to Jake and not you. I want that. I want that bad. <laughs> it it actually will tell you what to get it to, and they that was a nineteenth century powder tester. Dude, I, I got to get one of those now. That sounds like. As a matter of fact, Jake needs one of those horribly. That's the best thing that Jake could ever get for his channel altogether. Yep. He needs that. But I want one now, too. Almost as much as I want one of those rat guns you have. Oh, the mouse killer? Yeah. I could probably handle that on, on live stream and not get in trouble because they wouldn't know what it was. It is technically a gun you set up yeah, in your it's house. A mouse it's a mousetrap. It's, but it's it's basically a gun. You it's What size was it? A, it's a 32 36 caliber. Cal? 32. It's originally, they made them in 1862. They were called the Mouse Killer, and it is just a gun with a mousetrap T set up on it and a little cannon barrel. And uh, it looked like Can it you imagine nasty. waking up in the middle of the night with that? Oh, I could imagine forgetting I said it and then stepping on it. Oh, oh man, yeah, me too. <laughs> Amputation Royal. <laughs> I bet you PTSD was crazy back then when you had rats. <laughs> yeah, pow! Oh, what the heck was that? Every five seconds. Oh, and that'd be, that, would, that thing is so cool. I want one so bad. That's funny. Yeah, uh, Louisiana Gray said, I don't find my homemade caps to work good on six guns, but on rifles, they're great. Yeah, I would make them for rifles if I had to. Yeah. I think that rifles would be the best way to use it. Yeah. Because if I could make 60 in an hour, one hour would make me three weeks worth of shooting plus, <laughs> you know? Exactly. exactly. I, I could see that as being... 100% or single shot, you know, pistols, what little there are. Okay. Timber Drifter said, how do you stop rusting a 40-inch barrel long rifle? How would you boil that barrel? Okay, let's get down to this one. One, there's a couple ways of doing this. Easiest way of doing it is, uh, actually, I'll go on the harder kind of way of doing this, is to go down to, like, Home Depot. And buy, uh, you know, the, the metal grate they use for your gutters in your house? Get the ends together as well on whatever length you need to make it. Buy the sealant, the little silicone sealant to seal it so it holds water. Take it outside on a turkey, the turkey baster, uh, what the heck are those things called? Deep you know, like, you, Deep yeah, yeah, yeah. And put that over it. And then once the water's boiling, you can stick the barrel in that. Another one that I've actually used, and you know, I, I love the way it works, is just using the way they would do for rust blowing when they would blow the rust off that is just buy a PVC pipe. Um, at the very top of it, put the plug with a little area for you to put the wires so you can hang the, the, the barrel. So the barrel's hanging down the pipe. 
And then at the bottom of that barrel, you buy a, uh, a pot, regular big stainless steel pot, drill a hole on the top of that pot. So the steam rises through that PVC pipe once you put the lid on it. And then once you turn that on and the water's boiling in that, that, uh, pot, the steam comes up through that PVC pipe where the, the barrels, you know, hanging into and the steam will do it. The steam has got plenty of, uh, heat to still turn that, still do the exact same process instead of blowing it underwater itself. Yeah. Actually, steam will do it. I'm very familiar with the guttering, but I had not ever heard that style. I'm sure you probably yep. told me. And it I takes a little bit longer, <laughs> but it works fine. Okay. Let's see. I use the 22 primer reloading. Louisiana Gray said, okay. 22 primer reloading compound. Oh, cool. So you're not using the actual paper caps. Um. Uh, Rock McLaughlin said, I started seeing a good supply of the RWS 1075 caps. If Remington 10s are 100%, 1075s are 98% for me on the same nipples, multiple cap and balls. Yeah, I found the 1075s to be better than the CCIs and just as good as the Remingtons, I thought. As a matter of fact, they seem hotter. Uh, it just depends. I don't on have too much experience with if you're shooting on an originals or replicas, because they fit replicas better than originals, which is the case with most uh, yeah. caps. Most modern caps don't fit hey. very well. Great Pilgrim's in. He said, hi, guys. Hey, uh, Gray. Great. Oops, hang on. Gray said, I use Strike Anywhere match heads and a pinch of 4F. Cool. That'll do it. Ethan said, no conicals in the revolution. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Uh, cone heads are from France. Uh, Arizona Frontiersman said, with the shortage of percussion caps, 10 and 11, would you think that some entrepreneur would jump on the opportunity to upstart the business devoted to caps and primers? Is it red tape? Yeah, somebody just did. I actually did. asked somebody that question a while did. ago. Somebody just did. Uh, some company. I don't think it was GoX. Uh, I think if you go back and watch the I Love Muzzleloading channel, the last few weeks videos, he made a video where there is a company, one of the bigger companies, that put out an announcement they're going to give CCI a run for their money because Remington 10s are so far gone. Somebody's going to make a new cap, and it's going to be supposedly the perfect cap. Hope so. So I don't know who. I, I actually I forgot when I brought that. I brought that up in a like a live chat a long time ago, somewhere. I think uh, I was I complaining say, about it too. I want to say GoX might be doing it, but I don't remember if that, or Estes Energies, but I don't remember for sure if that's what he said. It's like, how hard could it be to start a company up making these? But then I realized you're going to need a, an explosive license with all the other crazy red tape. Well, that's the thing. Estes Energies and GoX already have that. Exactly. They already have that stuff. So they're the perfect people to start. If, if you don't have it, it would probably take you five to 10 years to get the, the facilities and all the red tape started just to start production. Yeah. Uh,. Let's see. Louisiana Gray said, "I'm pretty sure Mike Bellevue said all signature series were nothing but you birdies." Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the third gens. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Anyone heard from Mike lately? Gray program said, "Yeah, he had a bad fall. Uh, I can't remember where he was, but he broke a bunch of ribs and had maybe his hip, like Who? like massive amount of uh, Mike Bellevue." Oh, did he? Massive oh. amounts of broken bones, and he has not been online for a while. Like he was in the hospital for the last month plus. Oh wow! So I I don't remember exactly what it was. If you go read his community posts, he's posted about it. Uh, I think Duke was the one who told me about it. But yeah, he had a bad fall back Ooh. in the winter on an icy day. Uh, Louisiana Gray said, "Seriously, doubt they would have progressive rifling." Yeah, the signature series, aka the third gens no they definitely won't have it now everything i've seen about the third gens is bad they're the signature series but i'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on the second because i will be really happily like happy to hear if they do my little bit of research in the ones i played with they didn't but i just might have seen special ones i don't know i hope i'm wrong that'd be cool i would really love to know that the second ones had the progressive rifling because that's really part of the whole you know yeah. Thing. Tim O'Neill said, I'm still building black powder pistols still, and I live in an apartment. Landlords take a dim view on casting, making your own powder and caps. So does 
you require insurance for your contents. Now, I don't, but I own my own property, my own house, and everything. And I don't it's make very it easy. In the house. You just don't let them see you do it. <laughs> I don't do uh, it in the house. I do it out back. I have a specific shed just for nothing but making powder. And if that little shed ever blows up, well, first of all, I'm on the fire department and the fire truck's right down there. I'll, I go get it, I'll put it out. And if it ever blows up, it's a little 15 by 10 foot shed. It's not the end of the world. And like I said, the way I do it, I don't know. Yeah. Do you uh, hose clamp the rubber cap on the end of your, you know, you use a glass jar. Yeah, I do. Mine would be a little bit more dangerous than yours because it, it, it would build up some pressure. Yeah, it probably throw some shrapnel, but not still much. not that much pressure. Yeah, I, like it, that, I use a really, paper. yeah, yeah. That how you make it is important because if you use it like, especially with like a, a rubber ends that are like, yeah, clamped on with hose clamps, yeah. it's not going to build enough pressure to become explosive. Yeah, it would burn, like, like you know, it, it might make a little pop, but nothing crazy. You're not going to, yeah, you're not going to make a, it's not going to be a, an explosion, explosion. You have to have pressure to have that. That's kind of why you, when you make it, you don't want to use large quantities and or you want to use soft materials like rubber or something like that. Uh, let's see. Gray Pilgrim said, I have two walkers, one Army San Marco and one I have no idea. <laughs> Guns in the water, three weeks or so. Uh, Best Badness said, do you need to cut the walker to put the stock on it? No, not at all. A matter of fact, if you, if you use this style of... Um, shoulder. Uh, so this is the scale. It's called the skeleton version, and it's for the single action armies, the eighteen seventy three single action armies. What how, how you mount these to the gun? I wish I could show you guys, but the hammer screw that holds your hammer in, it comes with longer ones, and you have to make sure that it fits whatever it is. Like if you have a replica or original, whatever. Um, and I have a lathe, so I made a couple for my my dragoon because I've shot my dragoon with that thing as well. You just change that out so now you have it's longer on each side and it has a the little hook that hooks into the top up here at the top is it has two little holes where it would slide into where that um that hammer screw would be because now it's it's longer than the normal so the head sticking out plus the other side sticking out you click it in there and you clip it around the bottom and you just once you put it around the bottom of the buttstock there there's a nut and you just tighten that nut down and it holds perfectly and what's, you don't have to modify any gun to make it fit. Um, now, I did have to modify that one a little bit to make it fit the walker because the walker's um, wider than the single action army. The single action army frame is like the size of 51 Navy and the walker's you know wider. So I had to file out a lot of the inside of that to make it wider. But other than that, now it fits great. And then once even I made it wider, it still fits on the other guns just fine. There's no slop or anything. Yeah. Uh, you might have to just make a video about that. You know, I think I should. Yeah. Be checking I'm out telling the Snapper's you. channel. He might make one. I might make a video one of these days. It's been a while. <laughs> uh, let's see. Goss Loco said, on early conical projectiles, I suggest the English cartridge by Brett Gibbons' paper cartridge YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, Doug Duke said, Mike posted just a day or so back, posted x-rays of pins in his arm, said his back was better, still has a lot of troubles with stairs. Uh, At least he's getting better. Guns and Water said they did a short run with progressive rifling. Well, that must be what I have because I'm pretty sure that Walker's got progressive rifling. So they did a short run with the second gens. Yeah. Interesting. I got to find that. I actually need to know this now because that would be neat. Yeah. Gray Pilgrim said my latest is an 1863 Remington 31 pocket. Shoots well. I saw your video you did on that the other day, I think. Uh, let's see. Well, some of these guys, I'm I'm not sure what they were talking about because I've scrolled past the original conversation. Uh, uh, Ethan said conical bullets were first designed by Captain John Norton of the British Army in 1832. Cool. Uh, iPod said among the first pointed conical bullets designed by Captain John Norton, British Army, 1832. Norton's bullet had a hollow base made of a lotus pith on a firing expanded engaged rifling. And Ethan said, Jinx, you owe me a soda. <laughs> they both hit it at the same time. Uh, yeah, you missed that one. Uh, it's been maybe two months ago, Guns and Water. 
Uh, iPod Walker said, thanks, Googled it. Rather owe it to you than to pay it. Okay. I'm not sure what that was about. Uh, Kent said, night, y'all. Have to do work to do. Go well, good night to you. Um, oh, yeah. Both iPod and Ethan both said they Googled it. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Tim O'Neill said, never bought a Dragoon. My first carbine. Was an 1855 58 caliber round ball shooter with a stock and a 12 inch barrel. Never seen YouTube 12 inch barrel dragoon pistol. I live in Florida and have blued guns and use ballast all. Uh, there's an 18 inch walker on uh, the Black Powder Shooter 44's channel. Mm -hmm. Not a 12 inch that I'm aware of. Uh, Gray Pilgrim said, I use PVC pipe loaded with evapor rust. It turns it black. Uh, that will do it, too. Evapor rust is pretty good stuff. Yep. Timber Drifter said, thanks for the answer on stopping rust on the 40-inch barrel. Very helpful. Guns of the West is in. Says, hello, Relay hey. Show. Hi, Dustin. Uh, iPod Walker, anyone see the trailer for Civil War? Nah, it's modern stuff i'm not too interested in it but i might be i don't know depends on Ethan tells me i should be uh by land and sea says howdy everyone yeah whoever it was that asked about the rolling block history earlier go check out by land and sea he's got so, a, a video on it that i'm aware of if it's still there uh the kodak tackman said what do y'all recommend on Pieta cap jamming? I have the right size nipples for caps. Should I get extra mainsprings? First, I would say that if they if they they are the right size caps, you know, you're putting on the nipples, then I would go with the mainspring. But it also could be that the nipples, the 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 fire, the hole in the middle of it is too big. They make them too big. Yeah. So all that pressure is when they're smaller, there's less pressure going backwards. So you don't need as heavy of a, a hammer spring, but a good heavy hammer spring on top of the right size hole in the, the middle of that nipple is winner. Every time it makes the biggest difference. You can turn a, any gun into a sweet shooting gun that doesn't cap jam hardly ever unless you let Dustin use it. <laughs> and if all else fails, polish the hammer base. Arizona Frontiersman said, thanks a lot, guys. By Land and Sea said, howdy, everyone. Uh, James Cox said, how about the guy from Black Powder TV? Yeah, uh, Bob McBride, he had cancer. He made a video about it. He's still with us as far as I know. I haven't heard any updates, but I think he got to where I was. After a while, he was just tired of looking at guns through cameras and wanted to look at them with his eyeballs. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's living the life. I still see him as of not too long ago, pop up in comment sections and over in the American long rifle forum. So he, he's still around, I think, but he's just out of the game for a while. I'm sure he'll come back someday. He had the fastest growing black powder channel ever. I think at 14,000 in just a year. <laughs> he was That's pretty crazy. He had good content though. You know, it is uh, kind of sad that the, the YouTube kind of does that to everybody. So many times I just want to shoot my gun, just enjoy shooting it and not turn the camera on and not, you know. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the trouble is, once you hit that place, unless you're like me and have an Ethan backup, or Ethan has me for backup, your channel dies. <laughs> it takes a lot. Oh, you're right. Your motorcycle's too much. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Birch said, my second Gen 51, unfortunately, does not have uh, progressive rifling. Uh, uh, Tim O'Neill said, I can see me in my apartment with that. I have a living room just soaking a Civil War holster in ballastol spray. I miss Mike. He showed me everything about Colts. My landlord requires $50,000 fire insurance. Okay. Maybe, just maybe, don't let them know that kind of stuff. <laughs> saying. Yeah. Because it's sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. I mean, see you later, Turkey Creek. I got we got to get down there sometime soon and do a collaboration with Turkey Creek. Uh, I think I got it in my mind to do it this spring if you'll have me again. <laughs> 
Ethan needs to finish that side end test on the 1803 Harper's Ferry. We got part mm-hmm. of the film, but we don't have all of it yet. Because Turkey Creek custom built that gun for us. We need to really gotta get out there when the wind ever quits blowing. But like Turkey Creek said, <laughs> when does that ever happen? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. James Singer asks Slicks or Tresco's? Nipples. I've only used the originals, so. <laughs> I never, I must have had good run with Pietas the first few years I was running them because I didn't have cat jams in my hands. I think the, the, exper- the most experienced, I have tried both. Um, I think the Tresco's are the ones that. Um, Slick Shots got the hole in the side. Right, right, right. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was about to say his name Squibload. When we were, I was working on some of his guns, which I still haven't finished, which I need to get done. Squibs Walton Gunnison. Um, he had picked up some uh, aftermarket nipples. And uh, there was some slick shots. And some, I think the other ones were Tresco. They might be. But they look like regular nipples. They just have a smaller uh, fire hole in the middle of them. Mm-hmm. And I really liked those. Just because they, they look stock. You know, having the hole in the side kind of, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Tim O'Neill said, don't do that to your guns. You don't need to. Guns have a soul. Not sure. That is true. They do, I think. Maybe. Hopefully. Some of them do. Some of them do. Not all, though. And some of them have a black soul. Yes. Rimming. Haunted. <laughs> Freaking Colt of mine. <laughs> Kodak Tackman said slick spring nipples on both revolvers for number 11 caps. Uh, Greg Pilgrim said, I found I can shoot or I can film, but I can't do both. Exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. Squibload said, Snapper, hey, jump back in, heading to bed. I'll listen this weekend on replay. As a matter of fact, I need to get a hold of him. I haven't talked to him in a while. Let them know the stuff I've gotten finished for them. Uh, Doug Duke says, does Sure Shot still make nipples? They have holes in the sides to relieve the excess pressure. I don't know. I know Slick Shots have holes in the side. I don't know. Have you heard of Sure, sure Shot? That sounds familiar, but at the same time, it doesn't. Okay. I don't know. Joshua Harris said, I did the mods on Duelist 1954 said on his model on Pieta 51 Navy slick shot nipples. JB welded the hammer notch. Works great. Perfect. Uh, Tim O'Neill said, treat with love and care and they won't let you down like any companion. Greg Pilgrim said, I own my own place in the country. It's far better than renting. Uh, Greg Pilgrim said, slicks are best. Timber Drifter said, what do you think of the Blackie Thomas Percussion Revolver Series? Are you familiar with it? A little bit. Oh, yes, very much. As a matter of fact, I bought, or the Channel 11 Bang Bang bought one of his cap and ball revolvers, and Snapper rebuilt it for him, and we mm-hmm. gifted it to him. His, uh, his, uh, it was a Whitneyville Dragoon. Whitneyville Dragoon, yes. I uh, nickel plated the, uh, the, the bottom brass parts, and I also fire blued the, uh, the trigger spring. It was the or the trigger. It was a gorgeous gun when it was done. Man, that thing was pretty. We need to have him back. We used to have Blackie on this chat often, and he's such a great storyteller. And I need to have him back. We still text each other from time to time, but I need to have him back on sometime. But yeah, like I, I love said, listening to Black. I could hear him talk all day long. He's oh, got some yeah. of the best stories, man. He just goes. He is a natural talker. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, uh, Gray Pilgrim said he is good and his gun butter is per voodoo. No kidding. I just ran no out of kidding. my first jar. I just ran. I'm going to have to order some more. I'll have to go back to my video to find out what the link was for me to order. it. <laughs> I don't know what he did or who sold, he sold to somebody, but that stuff is phenomenal. I don't I've know, never, don't I've be, never used anything better. Too much there, Snapper. You'll be accused of being a snake oil salesman again. Uh, well, if if selling that's the telling the truth about something makes me a snake oil salesman, then by all means. We, uh, no, we, I, we had a big one on that. That was fun. I did a video where I tested it versus other things on a Remington revolver, 
and it just made the Remington revolver run and run and run. And then I purposely did not clean that Remington revolver for a month. Picked it up, put it on camera, cocked the hammer, spun it. Yeah. And I was like, and then somebody was mad saying that Cresco yep. works just as good. And I'm like, I've been shooting cap and ball revolvers my whole life. And yes, I have used Crisco and yes, it works, but it doesn't work that good. No, <laughs> I've never, and this is not even just, you know, I, I like Blackie. He's a good guy. I consider him a friend, but no matter who it is, if somebody's going to push something that I don't believe in, I'm not going to say something about it. I'm like, if, if I actually like it, I'll say something. If I don't, I might say that. I don't know. I haven't really come across much friend stuff that actually doesn't work very good because most of the guys that I know on this, they're doing their best to be as honest and as truthful as possible. And I'm telling you, when it comes to that stuff, that Blackie's gun butter, I have never, ever, ever used anything like it. Yep. It is the best I've ever seen ever for black powder firearms. Flintlock, flintlock patch. Everything. On a yeah. Load, 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 load that. 36 caliber Kibler literally all day long without stopping the best. I and promise I you that is not some sales bargain yeah. jargon. Just get a little bit and try it. And then you just go from there. I, I, I can good. guarantee you, you'll have some, you know, it's good when you wipe the bore between three shots. If you try to, it gets harder to load because you've wiped all the butt gun butter out. It's actually easier to not swap the barrel and keep. Shooting. Yeah. That's good lube. That's, that's what you're looking for. A matter of fact, I I if I have an older video of mine from when I shot my Griswold and Gunnison because I was curious about regular black powder, and I was used back at the time making the um you know lamb tallow and beeswax um uh, you know historical style uh, lube right, and after like fifty shots that gun is tight like really tight, but I was kind of curious how much how hard is it to unloosen it once it happens just a little tiny bit of water and the whole thing unloosens though, but the craziest thing about black is gun butter. The gun never got tight, like at all. It at 50th shot, it still felt like it was at the first six shots. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, uh, they're still talking about the guns have a soul. Squib Load said my firearms have a soul. Yeah, uh, me and and Plowboy had a conversation one day where we came to the conclusion that so long as it doesn't have plastic on it, it has a soul. But plastic starts chipping away the soul. Mm. The more plastic, the worse. I'm pretty sure a Kel, uh, Keltec Sub 2000 doesn't have a soul. It's like a Frank. I, I think we would all agree on that one. I mean, I think that's a, I think the entire internet could get behind us on that. Literally, the more wood the gun has on it, the more soul. So a Pennsylvania long rifle has about the most soul you can get, one with about a 43-inch barrel. <laughs> <laughs> would have to agree. <laughs> oh, Ethan said. Well, think about it too: is the idea that wood is a was a living creature in mean, yeah, itself, it, right? It was something alive, yeah. The warmth so, of wood, warmth of the wood, and the cold of that steel gives it a personality like mm -hmm. nothing else. Yep, because you feel like a man formed that a little more than plastic that was melted into. A yeah, it wasn't just injected molding. You had to some guy over there with files or something. The gun is way older than the gun is when you have wood on it. <laughs> but anyway, Ethan, uh, well, great, great program. said, Blackie is an old fella who knows his stuff. But Ethan said, I'm pretty sure my French AN9 musket surrendered its soul at Waterloo. <laughs> oh, Joshua Sarah said, I had to be up early going to bed. Good night, everyone. Good night. Night. Kodak Tackman said, glad to know y'all are still in contact with old Blackie Thomas. I watch oh, quite gosh. often. He's close to my area, and he's my go-to for black powder info and other outdoor life. Yeah, I think he moved his whole black powder thing to Rumble, though. Unless I, I think uh, so too. Great. Program. His courses are good, by the way. If you ever, he has a course where you can watch his courses, yeah. and they're good. Uh, I've seen pretty much. I think I think I've seen all of them for the most part, and black, they are actually good. Black I learned stuff. Step above most people because of his history. He has gunsmithing. And that one story he has of the single action army going full auto, it's hard to believe, but when he explains it, you're like, it, it would absolutely be, can. You're like, it, that, that would, that could happen. Yeah. It's hard to believe, but yeah, technically that could happen. Mm -hmm. Man, I want to see a full, I want to see a uh, single action army go full auto once. It I want to see that. 
It requires the wrong kind of firing pin and a combination of bad caps, or I mean bad primers, but it can happen. I want to see that so I, bad. I absolutely be believe it with the in-depth description he made of that. Yeah, I do too. That's like, yeah. Could you imagine that with plowboy loads though? You'd be. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you shoot behind you. <laughs> oh, Greg Pilgrim said, I have a few that have a soul. Yes, your video on your, I think you have the 1892 Colt revolver that was your grandpa's. Mm. Your great grandpa's with the original. That thing's holster. got a soul. The holster has a soul too. It does. Yes, it does. Absolutely. You know, uh, like what you were saying earlier, though, like a man, somebody actually had to sit down and take the time to build it, which you don't get out of plastic. Yep. But that's another reason why I love these old guns, because even the people who didn't make it, yep. this is the closest you could get to shaking somebody's hand that's long dead. Yep. It's the closest you could get. And that's where the history comes in, like especially on the trap doors, because it's gotten to where the point where I've read so much. I know it's at least one of about 30 guys that formed this and put this part on of this yep. gun in particular. And you're like, I don't know exactly which one it was, but I know what group it was, what those guys were going through at the time, what they felt, you know, their reports back to the office, uh, the guys who were sick or, you know, all those reports are in the records. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that when you realize the amount of man hours it took to hand file this trigger guard to perfection to fit in here. And you're like, there is soul in here. This is something human about this again. Yeah, very. They, you just don't get with mass produced things that are not made by hand. Yep. But it is cool. And even the stories that pass along with them, like for instance, that little 73 Winchester right there. Yep. And that gun was new. There were no cars. Like that thing had to ride on a horse in a mm -hmm. buggy or a train to go anywhere. That means I guarantee you that thing has been on horseback, hundred percent been on horseback. Oh yeah, and like a hundred percent. Just look and at just the wear patterns that. on it. It's oh yeah, you can see where it would actually sit across the. Yeah, you can see where it sits across the the the. It's not the pommel, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, well, yeah, it would be the the pommel, the horn. Yeah, up in there. Yeah. It's it's just phenomenal that so many of these guns and like for instance that little that little guy right we, yeah. the only thing I know about that little guy is that it was in uh, Louisiana uh what was it uh War of the battle of yeah it was in the battle of War of 1812 Jackson it was uh, uh Saint no not Saint Louis New Orleans yes yeah. that was in New Orleans. And at one time, must have been carried by a British officer. That's all we could say. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was found there, like, like right after the battle, and that's what we know about it. That's about all I know about it. But it's a secret. It's just neat. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, they all got, they get a soul, and the older they get, the more soul they get. That's why I have yeah, blocks because that that polymer frame ain't gonna get old enough to have a soul. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, unless the world changes really weird where they think plastic becomes a rare, strange, cool oddity. Yep. A Gray Pilgrim said my 1861 Springfield is haunted. Well, it's probably hanging around with your single action army. Probably, yeah. You need to get it away from my single action army. It's a bad, it, it's got a bad, uh, it's, it's pretty bad, bad about doing that. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a bad vibe. I think it's more like a, you better take care of this vibe or I'll take care of you vibe. <laughs> That's what it seems to me about. Nah, I think all Keltex have a soul. Well, I guess if it means something to your soul, then it has a soul. So, who am I to argue? Uh, guns are good, all of them. I just like some better. Than all of them. Ones. There's no. There's never been a bad gun. <laughs> well, there might have been some dumb ones, but never a bad <laughs> gun. I was about to say there, there's probably one or two that was, you know, that first Patterson might be considered a bad gun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kodak Tackman said, "Agree on the plastic conclusion." Uh, and Gray Pilgrim said, "I'm glad to know folks who are not in love with plastic guns." Yeah, I just they just they're boring to me. I've honestly, I've got a home defense shotgun and a couple of home defense revolvers. I just sold my last plastic gun. Uh, I've got we got a pile of AKs. If I need one, I can go grab one. But uh, 
I literally got to the point, and I was talking to Plowboy about this the other day. I'll probably never hunt center fire smokeless again. I haven't done it in like three years. I'll probably honestly never hunt smokeless period again. I think unless it was a life and death situation where you ended up yeah, like right. it up. If, yeah. If it was life and death situation and I was hunting, I'd still use my foot lock or, or, you know, or a cap lock rifle or something. And I'm not saying there's anything against them. It's just, uh, and some people love them and I still have the revolvers. I like big boy revolvers, obviously still, but, uh, or like 44 special and stuff like that. 45 cold, but, but I, uh, I was just telling, uh, we were just talking to Plowboy, and I was like, there just comes a point where it gets boring. It all looks the same and absolutely nothing against other people loving plastic guns or modern guns. Go for it. I have them for when I absolutely have to use them, but just for enjoyment and hunting, I think I'm I'm past it now. I think I got one exception for plastic, but a certain kind of plastic, Bakelite. Because then you can go into the Vietnam era M16s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be. And that early AK stuff. Like I think those are that that has a. It's yeah, I wouldn't say it's a, a step like it's a step above plastic. But, you know, I think it's getting there close to maybe maybe getting a soul area there because it's more of a natural plastic -y. But, yeah, and it has the history, too. So it might give it a little bit more credence. Yeah. Uh, like, I and I absolutely understand why you have to have modern guns, and I still have them. It's just not something I enjoy. Your enjoyment's gone out of it. I don't know if it's the same for you, but it's just... See, same for me. I don't even enjoy shooting AR-15s anymore. Like, yeah. I just don't. It's the process I'm more in love with in the history now. And so I literally sold off everything I could sell to invest in my other channel the other day. And I kept like, of course, I'm keeping all my black powder stuff, but everything I could sell and still not feel like I was underarmed or defensive. But it's like, how many AR-15s can you own? And you can, you know, you only shoot one at a time, but I get it to some people. Collecting those is like for us collecting cap and ball revolvers. Yeah. Or some people ball. just absolutely love them and think they're the coolest thing ever. And if that's and what I mean, you're into, that, that's what you're into. But you know, that's just not me anymore. I just don't feel it. Okay. Timber Drifter said, I was really into black powder guns when I was a teenager 25 years ago, just now getting back into it. Well, I'm glad you're coming back to it. Yeah, nice. It's mostly because I haven't ran into the. I'm not in that crowd anymore that I was in, you know, when I was 22 and in the oil field and everybody wanted, you know, that stuff. The crowd I'm with is you and Duke. <laughs> so it's like, uh, there's. Well, the thing, too, is like, think about it. When you're it, younger, it, it, you only, want the cool, high yeah. speed, fast, hardcore, you know, violent. The only exception is big bore revolvers, and Plowboy has me wanting a 41 Magnum. <laughs> he does that. Plowboy does that to people, he affects people that way. But, um, like, yeah, once you kind of get out of that, now I want something that has real meaning. I want something that lasts a lifetime. And the thing and, about flintlocks is you get to the point where you're like, I just want to build it myself. Mm. And with those long wood rifles, you pretty much can, except for the barrel and lock. And some people can even do it. What, what is cooler than passing down a family heirloom that you built yourself? Exactly. It's saying. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine... I mean, we always say it as like, oh, today's today, but 50 years ago, I'm sure grandparents were talking like the way we're talking here. And by, oh, yeah, I don't know if I build one. They probably wouldn't. And you would kill to have a, a rifle that your like, great, great grandfather would have built. Mm -hmm. Build one. It'll stay in the family as long as you don't have any weird kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it, it, can you imagine that? Like, that is a part of you that you can be passed down. I think that's great. I think everybody should at least do that once. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, and that's where I'm at right now because Ethan's building those, uh, and I'm getting into it too. I'm building one. I'm building a snap-ons, but Ethan's building those rifle shop kits from castings. Yeah. That's literally as close as you can get to building a gun without hand forging the parts because you've literally yep. got to heat treat every spring. You've got to bend every piece. You've got to forge every piece in, and he's getting good at it. And I was like, I'm more of the woodworker. He's more of the metal worker. I want to see what we can pull off. We if you got a hot enough forge, like you could like cast metals and some carving equipment, you can then make all the castings yourself too. 
Yeah, you could. You technically I mean, could. You technically could, and I suppose yeah. we should just do that, I guess, eventually. But one of these days. I mean, that would be cool. Like, don't get me wrong, the rifle shot stuff, that is truthfully, that is building a gun from scratch. Yeah. But that little bit step above that would be even building it, building it completely from scratch. Hammering yeah. out your own barrels and everything. Yeah. That I imagine that's in the work someday. Someday, so yeah. Do, like we would have to build a blacksmith shop and everything. I think, yeah, you'd have to build up to that. That's a little bit of a, a yeah. leaping off a cliff yeah. <laughs> scenario, yeah. doing it without never doing it before, or at least any experience like that. James Cox said, how's the best way to loop patches with lamb towel and beeswax, hot dip them and pat them, or how? How I do it, and this is just me, and I've done it a few times. Uh, used to use the towel. I've used wax. I've used it all kinds of stuff. Uh, I really like the Blackie Thomas's gun butter because it just works so well. And what I'll do is I will put it in actually, I cheat a little bit. This is not historic, but I'll take a pill bottle and I will either, if I'm using cut patches, pre-cut patches, I'll just stack them in there. And if I'm using rolled patch material that I'm going to cut at the muzzle, I'll roll it up real tight and stack it in there. And then I'll dab a spoonful of Blackie's gun butter on top seal it up, put it in the microwave for 45 seconds. And if it's a good wool patching, pillow ticking material, it'll sop all that up. Then I take it out on the concrete with a rubber mallet and I just set the whole pallet pile of, I'll, I'll do 200 at a time. Maybe I'll split them up into piles of about 50, set them on the concrete, give them one solid whack while they're still warm with the mallet. That'll spray out the stuff. And I know a lot of people say you're wasting lube when you do it that way. You could do it on a pan and save it, but that's just how I do it. And I can do two, three hundred in a matter of, I don't know, four or five minutes. Yeah. And, and I like to keep them pretty wet. Some people don't like to because if you leave it, your gun loaded, it can soap up some of the powder. But I tend to not leave my guns loaded. loaded. In the house, especially like a yeah, especially like a yeah. flint lock. I don't, yeah, I mean historically, I know why you would do it, but right. I don't tend to leave them loaded because I got to clean them. And if you're going to shoot till it's empty and then clean it, you can't leave it loaded. I guess you could load it right after you cleaned it, but I was always afraid that I would forget and double load it when I got back out to shoot it. So I just leave them empty. I always have a paranoia that somehow it's going to create a corrosion, even though I know it doesn't. I mean, I've seen so many guns that have been loaded for. Way longer than I've been alive, but <laughs> yeah, it just feels wrong. It just feels wrong to me, yeah. Um, okay, I thought, okay, let me see if I can get down here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, you're talking about the single action army full auto or desert rat. So that's like the 90s conversion full auto SKS by reversing the firing pin. <laughs> iPod Walker said, what happened to the rifles that were issued to Lewis and Clark Expedition? Nobody really knows, but a serial number 15, 1803 Harper's Ferry uh, prototype rifle showed up like two years ago. And for years, people debated, did uh, Lewis and Clark take the 1803? Did they take the 1792 contract rifles shortened? There was good evidence for both sides. But now we have number 15, which he ordered 15 guns. And it seems to be the Lewis and Clark gun. And unless somebody disproves it. I'm That'd be cool. Well, I'm pretty well convinced that's it. There's still a lot of evidence for the 1792s. But there is a video out on the firearms of Lewis and Clark. It's a lecture done by the National Park Service. I cannot remember his name who does the lecture, but he has collected a lot of original pieces, guns that could be, and he gives a whole breakdown on why the new evidence now is starting to point to the 1803 versus the uh, 1792. I got no dog in the fight. It's one. Of, it's literally, if you're into the flintlock muzzle loading world snapper this is literally remington and colt type aggression right these people have okay i get it and, and so it's like i'm not stepping one way or the other but there is some very very high strung people i didn't know much about lewis and clark until i started um on my well, what's josh's while well, what's extravaganza's videos 
I like that. That's pretty cool. It's something I haven't learned in a long time. I'm kind of going back through it. Well, he asked me to do kind of the, some of the gun study for him mm -hmm. on that series, and so I did. And I was, I was not leaning one way or the other for the 1792 rifles or the 1803 Harper's Ferry. See, the, the trouble with the 1803 Harper's Ferry was they take off in, what is it, June – of 1803 and Harper's Ferry presents the first 1803 Harper's Ferry in December of 1803 to the secretary of war. So the argument was, well, there weren't any made before they left. So therefore they had to have old 1792 contract rifles that were made. It's a whole different animal. They cut them down, board them up. And that's what they had. Well, there was, some uh, argument that Clark Lewis and Clark had made 15 prototypes of the 1803 Harper's Ferry. And when they take the gun to Secretary of War in December, he says, I don't prefer this change, this change. It has to have a brass piece on the end. He's like, you don't have a brass piece there. There's a change here, a change there. Well, serial number 15 does not have any of those changes. So, so those 15 prototype. seem more just like prototypes. Those are that, 15 prototypes. Hey, these are, we made these prototypes for you guys to go walk a long ways in that direction. Yep. And, and it should be good for it. Seems that to makes be sense. some argument. And the most of the only argument for the 1792 guns were, the whole argument was we don't have any existing guns like this, except we have the one they gave to Dearborn, Secretary. Gotcha. Now we have one pre. And, and it, it, it matches. It, yeah. it really matches. And the, it is serial okay. number 15. Unless it's proven to be a fake, which is always possible, as you know. Of course. But at the moment, it seems to be leaning that way. But the guns that Lewis and Clark had, pretty sure they got pretty hard used on that three year journey. I and would expect. When they came back, my guess would be. Because most of them were 1795 Springfields or the American Musket of Charlottesville pattern. So my guess is when they get back, they turn those guns back into the muskets into Springfield and the rifles into Harper's Ferry where they'll go for repairs. And any parts that are not repairable, they sell them for scrap. And any parts that are repairable get put in spare parts bins for repairing another gun and they just get disassembled into nothing. That sucks. But I also see how that happens. Yeah, it would be like today trying to find a certain, you know. Yeah. The rifle you went through boot camp with, Snapper. <laughs> right? Yeah, I bet it doesn't even exist yeah, anymore. No, the one I want is the Beretta I used when I was deployed. I want that freaking Beretta M9 so bad. Yep. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it probably doesn't even, I mean, for all I know, it's parts. But, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's understandable because that's, they saw these as tools. They weren't really looking at them as a historic thing at the time. Yep. I think by land and seas talking about old guns of souls, he said sometimes the older they get, the crankier they get. <laughs> That's their that would definitely fit with some of my guns. <laughs> sometimes the older they get, the crankier they get. Uh, let's see. Louisiana Gray said might have been the pirate Lafayette putting a British on the run in 1812, if only you could talk. Yeah, he's talking about your sea service pistol. Oh, yeah. All I do, that all I know about it is it came from a museum that was part of the the, the Battle of... Um, why do I keep thinking... Um, I keep thinking St. Louis, but it's not St. Louis. It's uh, New Louisiana. New Orleans. New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans, mm -hmm. where Jackson, you know, uh, did his thing. That's where... It was a supposedly a battlefield pickup from when it was bought from the museum. That's the all happy, listed at it in its auction. That's kind of a happy and sad thing that most it of is. our best guns we buy, we buy from museums because you know somebody it, donated that to that museum expecting it to be forever on display. I mean, we're happy we got it and we're taking care of it, but it's sad to know that the museums just sell them. That's why I tell people, like, don't donate your gun to a museum. Don't do it because... Unless it is some really rare special thing, like if, okay, if your great grandfather was, you know, General Patton, yes, donate that to a museum. 
But if he was just, you know, Private Joe Snuffy with the 101st Airborne and he bought this Luger back, don't tell me it's who he's in. Because all it's going to go is it's going to go put in a box somewhere in the bottom of the basement, potentially not get seen in decades, and more likely, it's just going to get sold to make the museum money. I, I promise you more than one of my guns has been through museums. I swear on my life. I'm pretty know, sure the Dragoon has been I through a museum. I know a lot of ours have because we buy them from the museum. Exactly. And all that happens is that means somebody gave that away for free, and that museum saw it and said, let's make cash with this. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting in a museum, go take it to a nice auction company and just thing. let it get auctioned. And it will end up at a better home anyway. Somebody will actually probably care for it. Now, as Doug Dukes always reminds me, there are exceptions. The Texas yeah. Ranger Museum, and I trust him, and he says that that's a good place. Uh, Museum of the Fur Trade, places like that where they actually, or the Cody Firearm Museum to an extent. But you just always got to bear in mind that if the museum is not firearms based, they don't like guns, most of them to start with. <laughs> and even if they are, like, like, I don't even know about Cody, Wyoming, you know, it's... It's, but the only thing I have with that if one they have everything. Day, what do they yeah. need one more for? They literally already have everything. If you donate it, it's probably unless it's something super special, like you said. Unless it's super duper special, like really special, just sell it on the market. If you if you have to get rid of it, you don't know I want to keep it in your family. I say just keep it, keep it in your family. But if you have to get rid of it, make some money with it. It doesn't make you a bad person. I would rather see you. You know, put it into the firearms trade where people are going to care for it and give money. You actually get something from it because all you're going to do is go give it to a museum thinking you did a good thing. At the end of the day, all you did was the museum kind of just robbed you. Yeah. If you, you thought it was going to go somewhere good, museum. you just, yeah, you just donated a bunch of money to and a museum. If you're lucky, if you're unlucky, they will permanently damage the gun to display it. That happens more than you would know. Or dip it in wax. <laughs> not going there tonight but yeah <laughs> anyway it's just yeah I, I i really would love it. if you already know anybody who's trying to donate something to a museum just let them know that the, the true facts of what it is mm -hmm. that you're giving this to a basically a corporation and the corporation does whatever it wants with it you're not going to have a say so unless you're donating it like not donating but letting them use it and they're not even going to want it unless it's something really, really, really crazy or special to somebody or real rare or something, something. So just if you have to get rid of it, just sell it, sell it, put on the market, make some good money for you and your family. You have to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. David W. said, good night, guys. Getting late in Ohio. Good night. Uh, Louisiana Gray was talking about the sea service pistol. He said that was Lafayette. Um. Uh, Guns and Water said the Zip 22 is a bad gun. Put the maker out of business. That is a pretty bad gun. The Zip 22, is that the one that shoots like two bullets at a time? I think. Now that might be the. Might be. The, the one that has the big trigger. I have to think. I think that's. Oh, I think it might be the one with the big trigger where it has like its double finger yeah, long. That, that's like the triple threat or something. It's called the real. Yeah, it's like. What in the world? Yeah, that is, that is a bad gun. I don't think that's the Zip. <laughs> Uh, Franklin Horse said, not much wood on a 1911, and I have to think some of them have a soul. Yeah, but they got some wood. Some got some wood. I mean, yeah. World War Ones. Yep. And like I said, Baker Light might come into play when it comes to plastics. I think that that, that might be on the edge. Half soul. Of, I would accept it. it it's passable. <laughs> it's passable. Uh, Rock McLaughlin said, my AR for coyotes and chicken defense. Otherwise, I usually stick to bows or black powder. Yeah. I've started getting the 36 caliber muzzle loaders for coyotes and chicken defense. 36 and 32s. Really want to get out there and try that Burns rifle at 32 on a coyote hunt because it's sighted in for such long range. That would be really cool. That would actually be really cool. I'm curious how that would do. About 40 grains of powder. I think that would really actually lay that little bitty 32 caliber round ball out there. I have a feeling it would. Uh, <laughs> the best badness said, I'd like to get a wood furniture G3. Uh, yeah, work it out. Max said, my boots have a soul. Mine <laughs> do too, but the soul has a hole in it. That's Very funny. holy. I love, well, Very like holy. Lucky Gunner said about the modern Smith & Wessons with the key lock on the side of them. Now, that's the hole where the gun soul leaks out. 
<laughs> True story. Uh, let's see. Timber Drifter said, I definitely enjoy the Bakelite AK mag. Something special about them in a weird kind of way. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Bakelite, we should we should make an exemption for Bakelite. Yeah. Well, Gunsmith4570 said, I'd love to go to a gun show that did not look like an AR-15 factory blew up all over it. Wooden steel is the best. Well, you need to go to that antique arm show where Snapper goes every year out there in Vegas. I would say you usually only see one or two AR-15 style rifles there, and they're usually like, uh, like an M110, like sniper rifle, you know, like actual U.S. military sniper rifle, with, you know, something, but uh, or a real Mark 12. But uh, yeah, go to the antique arm show in Las Vegas. You will be pretty happy. It's it's decently sized. I, I'd say it's it's definitely worth doing at least once, at least one time. It's good. Yeah, Kodo Tackman said my favorite handgun so far is an 1873 single action chamber for 45 Colt, and my favorite rifle is a lever gun. Take your pick. What's your favorite pistol, Snapper? Oh, everybody knows that single action army, 1873 single action army, 100. percent I got a little nostalgia myself for the 72 open top that I have, but that's just yeah for the history of it. I've just never, I don't have any experience with 72s. <laughs> I, I love the way they look though. By land and sea said, Ethan, I want to be just like you when I grew up. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ethan said, but muzzle litters give me the bestest feelings when I build it myself. Oh, Let's see. Bad, the best badness said, I'd like to try building an AK one day, but IDK, I'll, I don't know if I'd do it very well. Don't let Ethan fool you. Them first few, when he was trying to beat receivers out of uh, out of uh, windmill fins, <laughs> they weren't very pretty. It takes a little practice. Uh, Kodak Tackman said, AR and tactical kind of fell out of the way a couple years ago. But it started with the Western theme to begin with. Oh, AR and tactical kind of fell out of the way a couple years ago. Gotcha. But Carol Joel said, look for Wallace Gessler, the gunsmith, Colonials Willenberg. It was filmed. Oh, yeah. I am extremely familiar with that video. And I know he. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Uh, I've been familiar with that video since I can't remember when I first watched it. It's been on YouTube for a long ago. time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ethan said, as long as you can pay attention to detail and headspace, it's not too hard. Oregon Outback said, I thought the Blackfeet had a few of them. Um, yeah, the Wallace Gessler video on YouTube is very interesting. Yeah, he actually has some more modern stuff, too. He, not too long ago, did a, a lecture on the Southern uh, Virginia rifle, the early Virginia Shenandoah rifles. And uh, he did an excellent job on that about six months ago, I think it was, maybe a year ago. At least that's when the video was released. Uh, you just have to type in early Virginia rifle into YouTube, and as an old man, he does a, a complete uh, breakdown of it. Um, Oregon Outback said, I highly recommend giving your antique firearms to the Museum of the Outback. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ethan said the Zip 22 doesn't even look like a gun. Carrie Stottlemyre said, in California, we don't have gun shows. We have beef jerky and bead shows. <laughs> That's what I've heard. If you go to a gun show and there's, like, no guns there. It's just, like, people selling all the little odd and end stuff. Yeah, Donald Benson said, the antique arms show in Maryland is really good. Just bring your whole bank account. The one in Vegas is like that, but there are good deals to be found. I found a couple of really good deals there. Yep. And Ethan really said, good deal there. Ethan said, stop going to gun shows over a decade ago. Too many charlatan, charlatans. Yeah, and that's the difference. Yeah. We're talking about, when we're talking about these antique arm shows, that's where you're bringing in all the big auction houses and everything, bringing stuff to show up. Yeah. I do have a lot of trouble with the little local gun shows. Ugh. When it's, it comes to the ones like, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, they, Jared. The same guys have been showing up for. 40 years and they've been bringing the same piece of junk single shot shotgun <laughs> for 35 of those years and every year it goes up in price but they have never spent any money on oil or anything 
I, I'll tell you the funniest thing I've ever seen, because we used to hit all of those gun shows. Then we started going to gun auctions and where the market was actually right, not just the I know what I have, fella, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, gun auctions started taking off around here and people started going to them and the gun shows started dying. So one of the big gun dealers, and he was a local guy from a gun show, said, all right, I'll go to, I'll have my auction. I'm going to auction off a big chunk of my collection that I've been bringing to these gun shows. I'm just going to set it up for auction. He invited everybody out to his farm. They had this huge auction set up. And he probably had 150 people there, and the auctioneers started rattling off, and they had an old Stevens uh, Model C 410 shotgun that had a broken four in. And that auctioneer started off, who give me 200 bucks? Nobody. Nobody. Who give me 100? Nobody. Who will give me 10? Got a bid. And then we started running. He got it up to about $30. People stopped bidding. The guy comes running up, hold it, stop the auction. Stop, I'm not giving these pieces of art away for $25. He shut the whole thing down, sent everybody home. That is hilarious. That is hilarious. <laughs> I'll never forget that. We're not giving these guns away. And I was like, you literally just found market value for that gun you've been trying to sell 30 years for 300 bucks. And it was, like, <laughs> it was it, those are the kind of gun show guys. I just quit going to gun shows because it was. Yeah. They think they know absolutely everything, but they've never cracked a firearms book in their life. Everything they know is because they spent 30 years talking to the other guys that are their same age around at the other tables. And their, yeah. their gun values and their gun stories get bigger and bigger and bigger every year, even though we've never actually spent $50 on a firearms book <laughs> in our life, you know. And we definitely don't. I would say for those guys, even try the internet, but most of them don't do that either. <laughs> so. That's funny. That is pretty funny. But oh, yeah. uh, when it comes to uh, the gun, certain gun shows, like if you're always worried about the the sellers or like how you know shysty people can be, what is nice about the Las Vegas Antique Arms Show is you're vetted if you sell, and if anything you ever sell comes up not what it's supposed to be, you're never allowed to post there again, ever. Like, you're blackmailed for life kind of thing, or blackout, or blacklisted for life. So, you, you have a really good, uh, and most of it's big companies, like Murphy's, Rock Island Auction Company, and most of the people there are big-time collectors, too. And, honestly, the, the guns that you find good, it's usually these little auction companies that they'll have an auction, but they also have stuff for sale. And you usually find really good deals on that because it's some grandma brought in something. Oh, I just want to get this much for it. And that's how much it'd be for sale for. Like that, that uh, pocket Navy. I think it was 500 bucks. $500, yeah. man. And I was just like, I couldn't even believe it was $500. I, I couldn't jump fast enough to pay the man. Yep. It's, it's stuff like that. And I've come across single action army like frames that I, w I wish I would have bought it. It was an entire frame, and it was an actual, uh, I want to say it was like the 70, late 1870s frame, military frame with all the, you know, it, the frame itself was 200 bucks. I should have bought it. Should have bought it. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, you can't even find a frame for under a thousand these days. You can't even find half a gun for under a thousand these days. Yep. I wanted one time, and Ethan said he wanted me to tell this story. But I wanted a left-handed 30 out 6 bolt action one time real bad, and I was about 25 or so. And so I was like, I really wanted a Winchester. I had Winchester money, working in the oil field. But you can't ever find a left-handed, you know. So I walk in this gun show one day, little gun show, paid more money to get into gun shows than the guns were worth in there. But I got in there, and this guy has this Savage uh, 110. Woodstock, the wood's all beat up. It's actually a pretty old Savage 110, left-handed. And so I pick it up, and I open it, and ching, the spring comes shooting out the top. I asked him, I said, is that supposed to happen? He said, yeah, that's an M1 Grand action on your on this Savage 110. He said, it's a special deal. And I was like, uh-huh. But I hadn't seen any other deer season was coming. I didn't see any other guns handy by, close by. And uh, I was like, all right, he wanted like 500 bucks for it. So I was like, I, I really don't care. I bought it, 500 bucks. I bought it. Wasn't what I was looking for. I walked out. I told Ethan, I was laughing. I said, you want to see an M1 Grand action on a bolt action? 
I pulled it out, and that spring goes ping. Ethan says, here, let me show you. He pulls the pin, pulls the floor plate, turns it around right side up, and then says, now it works, because the floor plate was just upside down. <laughs> it's like, if I'd really been like in a, in a bad way, I wouldn't have given him the 500 bucks, because that was probably overpaying for it. That's uh, fine. But... Uh, you know, it was one of those deals. I had the money. There was no others, and deer season was around the corner. So I was like, I'm just going to do it. I don't care. <laughs> it was like, just turned the floor plate over, and we killed the M1 Grand Action. Probably knocked 100 bucks off the value of that gun. Took the right M1 away. Grand Action out of it. <laughs> uh, bah, 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 let's see. Uh, the best badness that I did see a cool Colt Police positive at a gun show recently. Yeah, if you're going to get one of those, make sure you know what you're getting because a lot of people buy those that say 38 and don't realize that's a 38 Smith & Wesson. The Colt Police Positive Special is a 38 Special. I'm sure you know that already, though. I'm just giving that to you. Uh, Jason Gaston said, or Josh Gaston said, just got off work late again. Hi, y'all. Carrie Stottlemyre said, we had a few of those guys at our local gun show. Same guy, same junk, just a higher price every time I see him. That's yep. exactly right. But when Snapper's talking about the antique arm show, he's talking about people like Rock Island Auction showing up with a walker. You know, it's not. Yeah, you see high end guns. You're going to see like 40, 50 Henrys. <laughs> I mean, hundreds of Winchesters. Some of the rarest, you know, like ones of 1000s, one of 100s. All that's there. It's basically like if you were a billionaire, you could walk out of that place with a museum pretty close to. You know, like Cody, Wyoming style museum. Imagine going to Cody, Wyoming museum and everything's for sale. That's the best way to put it. Oh, it's basically the SHOT Show, but for antique guns. And it's actually yeah. the same week as SHOT Show. The it's the exact same week, yep. Uh, let's see, Brandon Birch said, Snapper, is there any way I can visit with you about single-action army parks, frame, barrel, hammer, lower, trigger guard? Yeah, sure. Go, go comment on his channel. Yeah, you leave me a comment, and I'll I'll, I'll teach you how to. Uh, I'll give you information to contact me. Bring fifty subscribers with you, and he'll give you free information. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, uh, the best badness that I didn't get it. Grandpa told me he had an old official police at home, like Bogey had in a big sleep. Yeah, that kind of get romantic for those old revolvers like that too. Uh, those are those are those are the exception that I'll still look at. Uh, that Army Special. Once I figured out what it needed to shoot, that was a sweet shooting gun. And Not bad. Uh, Carrie uh, <laughs> Stottlemyre said that'd be the only reason I'd ever go to Vegas. <laughs> I lose, agree. If you're gonna lose all your money anyway, you might as well bring a gun home, right? Exactly. <laughs> I promise you, unless you're like some professional gambler, you're not going to win any money here. I think those days for Vegas is long gone. This place sucks money. It does not give away money. I just never forget that golden era of auctions. It was before people started the online bidding real heavy and right after the gun shows. Oh, that was so sweet. We just oh, had a... Bet. Well, you know, you were there for part of it. Oh, oh yeah, for the the pot. We oh man, I was original Colts for five hundred bucks. Yeah, I know. And you know, that's still probably the best deal I've ever seen on a forty nine pocket model. Well, it was during a rush on AR fifteens, and literally everybody was bringing their stuff to sell in those little. So they could buy AR fifteens. Yeah. yeah, I remember that's when those first <sighs> cheap, um, uh, not Indian, but. Uh, who makes the who makes those cheap shotguns, semi-autos, and pump actions? Why can I not think of it? They're not Pakistani. They're well. It's when those first cheap import shotguns were coming in, and mm -hmm. it was before the pandemic. I can't remember when it was exactly. It was right it, after we were in the pandemic at that time, but just barely. You know, and people were giving a thousand bucks a piece at those auctions for those cheap import shotguns because there just weren't any. And Colt revolvers were sitting on the table for four hundred dollars, and it was yep. just Turkish. Yes, Turkish. That's what I was thinking. And it was just the greatest time to be an antique firearms collector. Um, now is not that time. No, everybody's selling AR-15s all across the United States and trying to buy classic guns again. Mm -hmm. 
but it just goes in waves and you just got to watch the wave. Kinda yep. Goes. You just got to watch that wave and ride it. If you get the chance to, that, that yeah. is the best way to get some really nice guns. And what's kind of nice too is, and another reason I always tell people to do it. If you have the opportunity is they always become more valuable. I mean, I don't know of any gun that gets cheaper when it comes to antique guns, like actual real antique guns that, yeah, you might find a wave where little stupid stuff happens to make it cheaper. But overall, yeah. You can flip a forty nine pocket around any time and make more than you're gonna pay for it. I just five years, or just a year ago. You bought that forty nine pocket model for like four hundred, five hundred dollars. It's five hundred, I believe. And I walked away with an original Metropolitan Arms fifty one Navy for two hundred and I know Whitneyville double barrel ten gauge muzzle loading shotgun. It had need to have the hammers, needs the hammers for a hundred and fifty dollars. A Whitneyville. Like same mm -hmm. Whitneyville that made the walkers. <laughs> so. That little 49 pocket is really nice. You know, it's still, it's still one of the, the nicest 49 pockets I've seen in a long time. It is in yep. great shape. Ethan went to the auction the day before and bought an FN 49 30-06 and his Webley Mark VI for 120 bucks a piece during that Oof. run. It was just, it was a magical year. <laughs> hopefully you know if we ever have anything stupid happen which i hope we don't but at the same time it is what's nice is everybody's looking for new stuff they want to get rid of their old stuff to buy new stuff and they're scared yep i mean people were just hauling wooden steel guns in by the barrel full you could trade in if it was old and wooden steel they would trade four or five for one ar-15 mm -hmm. i remember h110 powder was selling for 300 dollars for 10 pounds uh ar-15s were bringing Oh man, I can't remember. Like you, Palmetto State Armory ARs were bringing eleven hundred dollars at that auction. Turns Which is insane. We're bringing a thousand dollars. I'll just never forget it. It was the craziest auction of my life. And then Caleb was over there bidding against you. I know. <laughs> it would have been even cheaper. There's even a video footage of it too. Yep. Ethan said he also picked up eighteen hundred rounds of surplus three hundred three for fifty bucks. Yeah, it was it was crazy times at those auctions. And then yeah, we that was that good auction times. back to a gun show where that guy still got that single shot for four hundred bucks. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Well, I, can, I can definitely tell you that last year, the uh, well, this year's antique gun shot it, it went up a lot, like yeah. a lot. Yeah, well, Metropolitans for three thousand dollars. You know, oh, I know it's crazy. I last auction I went to. They had a Rossi uh, R92 uh, stainless steel long octagon barrel for 900 bucks. That was high. That was crazy for me. And that's just looking around in these junk old classic guns. But I would say they were in poor condition. Yeah. Uh, you know, the old uh, the Winchester single shot. The I can't remember what model it was. But there's a single shot Winchester that, you know, generally sells four or five hundred bucks. Those things were bringing twelve hundred dollars. I was like, man, the wave just there's highs and lows and you got to hit it. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything if it had Colt on it at the last show, mm -hmm. you're going to spend three thousand dollars to get it. Yep. Yep. Uh, Leon the single actions. I think the cheapest one I saw was six thousand. It was insane, like insane. Lever actions are getting crazy. That's for sure. The best badness. It's because of Yellowstone in 1883. And he's Kevin Costner is releasing two more Westerns this summer together. The Horizon series. Look out. Depending on what they use in those movies, it's. I think it's going to be a wave to ride. It's, are your it's guns always at least a little one or a big one. What? Even little ones will save you or yep. get you. Which it's not bad because it may be the time to, if you have a pile of antique guns, maybe it's time to get rid of a few of those lessers and save so that get money yourself back, some bigger. Get something you want. You know, it's not bad. You just got to learn to ride the, ride the waves like YouTube. Yep. Ups and downs. Well, we've been going for two and a half hours here. Are you tired yet? Well, I can hang out for a little bit longer. Yeah. Well, you, if I you're tired, we can go. On you. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's I'm all good. up to you, buddy. I don't mind. I'm good. Uh, uh, let's see. Lever actions are getting crazy. <laughs> the best badness talk about those movies said, "Please, oh, please, don't have a Winchester '86 in it." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, back in 2012, his run on ARs picked up a Remington auto loading rifle, 35 Remington for 150 pre model eight, 1906. Great rifle. Yep, that's when to do it. I had a pile yep. of 22 back then that I sold for a lot of money. <laughs> Matter of fact, that's probably what I should do if next time there's a big rush. I've got way too much 22. My dad had, I mean, whew. just wait till closer to November, it'll be worth a lot of money. I guarantee Turn into something I will never use to flop it into something I might. Yep. That's that's no kidding. Uh, here lately, I'll just turn everything into flintlocks because I know I'll be able to shoot them no matter what. No matter what. I can find uh, I'm, I'm praying that we'll get some good runs of uh, some casts because uh, it's been a while since I've shot any cap and ball stuff since Jake was down. Yep. And uh, yeah, so you, you're, about to, you're about shot. to run out of that last stash that you found. No, I still have plenty of it. It's just I hate shooting that Remington number 11 or that, that CCI yeah. number 11. It just doesn't work very good at all in those guns. It's not enjoyable for most. No, people. If, if you're having to fight it all the time, mm -hmm. it's not enjoyable. And then it makes the gun, you know, you look at the gun bad, but once you get decent taps, yeah, it shoots beautifully. Yep. Well, we. We didn't buy caps, but last December when everybody was talking about there's going to be this powder shortage, we stocked up on primers, so we're good to go there at least. And I could never find any large pistol primers. All I could find was small. We bought All a bunch you. of them online. They were a little higher, but not terrible. I ended up with a crap ton of small. Matter of fact, I saw this. Uh, I saw a video of a guy who was loading 45 Colts. But it actually had small primers, small pistol primers. Yeah. I was kind of like, that must be interesting. Having a lathe, I wonder if I could do that. Well, there's Modify some 45 I've seen with small pistol primer pockets. I'm not. sure small pistol primers would still set off black powder 45 well, volt all day long. Yeah. They do. Uh, I mean, it'd probably be fine. Because last year, just refill I... Them. I bought that Ruger and 44 Special. I shot 1,500 rounds of 44 Special last year. I know that because I had 500 pieces of brass, and I've reloaded it three times. Yeah. So, well, I've reloaded it twice, and it's empty now. So, I did spend a lot of time with that last year. But it wasn't for hunting. That was just every day I'd go out and shoot a handful. Yeah. You know? Let's see. A Rock McLaughlin says, Snapper, Powder Valley still has RWS 1075s in stock. Uh, Timber Drifter said, fellas, thanks for the show. You Gotta got be shot. at the farm at 6 a.m. Gotta go. Well, we'll see you. Oh. How many people we got in here right now? I can't see. 49. We've been up to seven. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. And Rock McLaughlin uh, and Timber Drifter just left because now we're at 48. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys just sticking in with us. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, it's been a while since I've been on a live. It seems like it's been quite a while. Especially with you on live. Yep. Well, I haven't done. I probably won't be back on this for a while. I'm gonna let Ethan have it. The only reason I'm here tonight is because he had to be gone for army stuff. But I need to uh, no start. We've talked for a long time about the same way I do. I co-host the uh, Tales of the Trails with Duke. I need to start co-hosting a show with you on a different night. Yeah. Or if you do a show on your new channel, let me know. I'll happily. I'm not. Have, I'm 630 subscribers, so I need a thousand. To, well, I guess I don't technically have to have a thousand. Not if I use Streamyard. But no, might be. I'll throw some words out. Try to get you some more more subs. Ah, I'm not worried about it. That's like I've said before to everybody. That that's my enjoyment channel. It's like if if it if it ever becomes a hassle or. The comment section starts getting too crazy. I don't care over there. I just delete people. <laughs> so I, like, I don't care. Uh, if, if people start getting too rowdy in there, I don't, I don't put up with it anymore. When I first started 11 Bang Bang, well, I didn't start it. Ethan did. But when we first started, it was like, we have to please everybody. We have to have Oh, I remember. I remember. <laughs> we have to do everything just right. And then after about the 20,000 subscriber, we were like... If somebody's yep. feeling get hurt because we said something that was right, I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah, that person so, wasn't a fan anyways if they get that stuff but hurt so easily yeah. over other people's opinions. 
I'm like, it's it's there's too many good good subscribers out there to be worried about the bad ones. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Matter of fact, I've been kind of thinking about maybe starting another channel just because I don't want to stick any of the motorcycle stuff on my my channel. Mm -hmm. So I don't want it to chase anybody away. But uh, I definitely been thinking about maybe doing this because it get a little bit different side of me. But I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know me. It's kind of weird because I'll jump head first into any comments war because I just don't care. You know I will. On oh, any yeah. Channel. Uh, it's not necessarily the commenters. It's like I said, I just don't care anymore for a lot of the ringy ones. But it was when when other channels got ringy with me that was starting to bother me. And I yeah, I know. To step away from that. But I know. Yeah, him and Jake. No, just send me just send me your evil commenters. I will jump head first in and stay there all day long. <laughs> oh yeah, no matter if it, like like we said it a million times. Like like you said before when we first started this, it's like oh let's try to be nice and. Nah, nah. Now it's kind of like, hey, I'm kind of bored. <laughs> you guys got any messed up comments? <laughs> yeah, anybody we can fight over there? <laughs> and Jake always has one. <laughs> always, always. Poor Jake. Uh oh. Yeah, the funniest part is so many people get on him, and I never, I don't see it. I don't understand it. He he does everything he can to be as blatant and honest and truthful and not hide anything, but yet still people get butthurt about it. Yep. Yep. Ethan said, "I enter, I release my inner smart aleck on trolls." Yeah, <laughs> I do have fun with that. Like I said, it just it got to where there were some other channels that were bugging me, and that was when I decided I need to get off of here for just a little while. But you know what? I've been off for about a month. I feel pretty good about it. I've actually sat down, and like I said, Noah and I have been making stuff. You know, getting stuff done on Sundays for the other channel, even if we haven't released a lot of videos. And I've actually felt the creative mind start to flow again. I got ideas again. I'm not just feeling like, uh, I've got to go to the next video. So whenever I do come back full time to this channel at some point, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of good ideas that I have for both channels. Of course. Well, I mean, you got to have time off, man. Don't yeah. get burnt out. Yeah, I sent you that one text that one day. I never wanted. I sent you a text that I think I sent it to Duke, and I was like, I never want to see another YouTube screen again. <laughs> I never want to see another analytics page again. But I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting past that now. I feel pretty good coming know. on here tonight. This is the first time I felt like even coming on a chat outside of Duke's for a while. I'm feeling pretty good about it again. Ugh. I'm glad. Kind of missed you a lot. Yeah, yeah, we'll be back at it. But I also have to give Ethan his time because there's a lot of footlock. Oh, of course. Want to spend some time too? Like I said, I'll, I'll be back full time, just not for a little while. Oh. I understand. Heck, I've been away from the whole thing pretty much realistically, other than the live since the beginning of the year, just because I've been doing other stuff, spending time with the wife and whatnot. And I actually feel better myself. Like, even though I wasn't a hard hard workload or anything like that, it just if you step away from it a while, you can look back at it and see things that you didn't either appreciate or care about that much. And, you know, you get the, the juice is flowing again for creativity. That's that's okay. Ethan knows because I told him you're going to do it now for a while. And he was like, yeah, I'm coming back. I'll do it. And now he's getting behind on the videos. And he's like, videos, I got to get a video, I got to get a video. And I'll call him in the middle of the day and I'll be like, I have this great idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be like, we got to get a video out this week. Not, not a video that's going to take us three months to make. <laughs> to make. Hey, I got to let you go, man. My stomach is yeah. killing me. I yeah. That fancy restaurant food. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, I'm going to shut her down anyway. Been going almost three hours. Uh, so, bye, Snapper. If you're headed bye, out. Bye, guys. <laughs> All right. We'll see you. All right, guys, for any of you that's still out there, I'm going to let this run for just a little bit longer. If you got any last minutes, comments, questions, or concern, throw them out there, and we'll pull out of here in about 10 minutes. Uh, appreciate you, too, best badness. Adios, says Desert Rat. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, Rock and Clocklin. I forgot to read that. Yeah, that Powder Valley has RWS 1075s in stock. I'm sure he'll see that when he gets – he'll probably check out the end of this. Yeah. <laughs> Talkers will be blocked. I know what you mean, Carrie Stottlemyre. 
And I don't mind the comments because I'll, I'll go into it with the comments. It's when other channels start getting ringy with you over nothing. That was, I had a few, I had actually a bunch of them that were just pretty demanding of my time. And there was a lot going on. And I was like, guys, I got to have, you got to settle down. And uh, most of them got mad and left me anyway. So I don't care. I've met a lot of good people over this live chat, and I got plenty of channels I talk to. Uh, let's see. Desert Rat said this is better television. Okay, a few more questions here. Thanks, great one. Thanks, great one. Adios. Just having fun said, what was the most interesting flintlock you have shot or seen? One that you wanted to add to the collection? Well, right now, I really want a 62 caliber rifle, but that's just right now. Um, the one I've wanted to add and couldn't, there is a special match lock at the rifle shop that's already built, and I think it's called the Newtown Musket. It's supposed to be one of the uh, replica of the first National Guard issue gun, and it's a match lock from the 1620s, I think, with a rounded butt and very high quality maple. Uh, that's, that's one I've always kind of wanted to add, but it's, it's a pie in the sky at the moment. Cause it, I don't need another match lock. Uh, best badness said, I got a question you've more than likely heard before. If you don't mind, yeah, go ahead and ask it. Uh, yeah, I'm not going anywhere, Louisiana gray. I'm just taking a break for a while. And, uh, I'm always going to be over on Duke's chat. Uh, God's Luca said, thank you for an entertaining evening. Yeah. Clary Sotomayor said, you sort the wheat from the chaff for sure. Uh, Ethan said the wall guns one he'd like to add it. We already have, I think bought, so we will be adding, um, plowboys ghost. Hi, plowboy. We'll get you on sometime. He said, still going. I see. Yep. We're about to shut her down. Uh, the project videos are real cool. Hint, hint. Yeah, that's. And, and we're going to say a lot more of them. A lot of people don't like them, but we can do those inside after dark, after work, and not worry about the wind. So uh, the last project video we did was the Lehman rifle, I believe. It's done. Ethan's already took it out and shot it. Uh, everything's glued up. Everything's perfect to go on it. We just got to get a video filmed of shooting it. Uh, after that, we have an African slave trade musket with a broken stock that I really want to... Uh, it's a it's got a brown best barrel. It, it's a real interesting gun. It's authentic, historical. It was a flintlock converted to cap. And we've had it for a long time, and I've needed to clean it up and do some work on it. Haven't got to it, but Ethan and I dug it out the other day and said if we do another project gun video, that'll be the one. Uh so yeah, I, I'm glad you like them, uh, because they're easy to make. <laughs> uh Oh, yes, there are definitely, uh, best badness, there are definitely converted Dragoons. I don't know if I have a picture right now. Uh, I have a picture of a third model converted Dragoon with a 44 rimfire uh, cylinder in it that is like the Remington conversion cylinders where you pop it out and take the back off. And it was originally uh, 18, uh, it would have been converted in the 1860s to 44 Henry, I believe, in a, a, a third model Dragoon. And yeah, they converted a lot of them originally. There's actually a lot of pictures on it. Uh, I don't have it here in my hand, but uh, Charles Pate's book on the 1860 Army has a lot of pictures of Dragoons and that are converted. Um, pretty sure Haven and Belden has some down there, but my book's still falling apart. I don't want to dig it out. But yeah, there's... There's a lot of examples of converted dragoons. Now, walkers, that's a little different. I don't think I've ever actually seen a converted walker. I wish Snapper was still here. He probably has. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Ethan said, I'm bound to determine to put out one Willock video, project video per week. Uh, Louisiana Gray said, yeah, Ethan, I'll figure, I figure we get a lot of videos out of that new wheel lock you're working on. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Got about six minutes here, guys. So we hit three hours It'll be a good round number. Still got 40 people in here. So keep on commenting and we will do our best to make that up. Uh, do be looking for 
like I said, I'm not completely away from the channel because I still have my Trapdoor series going. Uh, I'm thinking within about two weeks, episode two is going to release if we can get the shooting segment filmed. The sling was the last thing I needed for the Model 1866, and I've ordered it, and it's supposed to be here pretty quick. Uh, so, big episode on the history of the first 5070 trapdoor, the Model 1866, second Allen conversion. That's where you get into the, there's going to, ha it'll have to do with the Fetterman fight. It's going to be used at the Wagon Box fight. It's going to be used at the Hayfield fight. It's going to be used in the Modoc War, uh, Southern Indian Wars, Franco-Prussian War, and actually be sent off to France and then brought back and be one of the most popular buffalo guns ever. And so that that's going to be a big episode, and I'm looking forward to making that one. That's one of the reasons I quit for the last month was just so I could think about it. And just thinking about it, I've got a lot of good ideas. Um. And I think we have an actual, Ethan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think next week for a video, we will have an actual interview from Jesse, the man who runs the rifle shop and the tour coming up on the channel. Ethan went down there and filmed some stuff. <sighs> Louisiana Gray said, betting all your experience on that first pistol, eh? I think he was. I think he was. That pistol works. It just needs to be finished. At least it sparks. Uh, let me get rid of this over here. Do that on the studio. All right, guys. We're going to go another four minutes. Four minutes to go. Uh, yeah. Surprised at how many 5070s there are still around. Yeah. They're, it's because they made a lot of them. They made... Uh, I gotta stop and think. I want to say they made fifty thousand sixty sixes. Now I'm gonna have it wrong. Fifty five thousand. I have to look at the book again. They sent twenty seven thousand of them to the Franco Prussian War. They made. Where did they make twenty seven thousand? Half of those. I have to look again. But uh, and then they made uh, probably closer to a hundred thousand of the sixty eights. I think. And they made a couple thousand of the 69 cadets. And they made about 12,000 of the 1870s. So it's one of the rarer ones. So yeah, there's there's over 100,000 of them that were made, not counting the parts guns that were made later. Well, there's a lot of 50s around. Yep. Okay, so it looks like we are doing the uh, next Sunday night at 8.30. We will be doing an interview and tour of the actual rifle shop in Oklahoma, I believe. Uh, Sunday at 8.30 at night, I believe, is our new release time on that. Yeah, it's going to be exciting to see Ethan build that. He's got to build a snap-ons, too, now. Lock. I'm going to build the rest of it, but he's got to build the lock. <clears throat> So anyway, it looks like everybody's kind of winding down here. We got two more minutes to go. And then we will shut this thing down right at three hours. It'll be a good round time to do it. Still have 37 people in here. I want to thank you all for coming out and watching, even though for the first half it was just me rambling. I'm sure next Wednesday night we will be on Tales of the Trails with Duke. And I think, and then, and by the way, check out his new channel, Tales of the Trails podcast, guys. Uh, he's on his second video having to do with Red Claws War. And uh, I made the music for some of it. I didn't make music for all of it, but it was a collaboration. And he's just moving right along. One of the best podcasts I've ever heard. And so uh, check that out. And then, like I said, a week from tonight, probably be Tales of the Trails live show. And then two weeks from the night, it'll be Ethan hosting the Reload Show and probably be talking to somebody about flintlocks again. <sighs> Ethan said he has to build a Dutch wheel lock Fowler and a Pattern 1776 and a snap on and a wall gun. Oh, thank you, Best Badness. Yeah, Ethan has a bunch of them to build. Hopefully, I'm going to be building a 62 caliber rifle 
too pretty soon on top of the building the snap on gun. We'll see how this goes. We may start making a bunch of them. It might be worth making them and selling them. <laughs> if I can do the woodwork, I'll let Ethan build the locks. I'm not into that metal work. <laughs> I don't have the patience for that metal work. All right, guys, we're going to go on out of here in about 20 seconds. So uh, appreciate you all for coming on. And appreciate you all for walking, watching on Duke and Snapper's channel. And I don't know when I'll see you again on the Reload Show, but hopefully it'll be in a month or two. Till then, trust in God. Keep your powder dry. Bye. <laughs>